Uh, let's see. Um, the open meeting is being conducted remotely, uh, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that these meetings are being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So at this time, I'd like to confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are here and can hear me, starting with Kim Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tentakoulis. Here, present. Steve Revelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. And I am Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Board. We also have two members of the Department of Planning and Community Development with us this evening, uh, Jennifer Raitt. Present. And Kelly Linema. Present. Fantastic. So as we move to the first agenda, um, item this evening, we will be opening the Warren article public hearings for the 2022 town meeting. Uh, there will be, for those of you who haven't joined us for these before, there will be four nights of hearings for a total of 18 articles this year. Consistent with past hearings, the ARB will be hearing from the applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the applicants this evening, but will reserve discussion and voting on each article to recommend action or no action until after all hearings have been complete. This is expected on April 4th. The typical format for each article that we'll be hearing this evening will be to hear from the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development regarding the me memo that they prepared and any items that they wish to highlight from that memo followed by up to a six minute presentation by the petitioners of the particular warrant article. We'll then take questions from the board, followed by public comments. We'll then ask the petitioner to address any questions and take final comments from the board members. And we'll go through this for each of these separate zoning articles this evening. So before we get into the first uh, article, Article 38, I do, um, want to ensure that we uh, speak about the, um, the, uh, the rules for the Warren Article public hearing. So if you can bear with me for a minute. Uh, the scope of this public hearing is the subject matter of the hearings is posted on the agenda. Any person wishing to address the ARB on the subject matter of the agenda item shall identify that you wish to speak by raising your hand when the chair announces consideration of each item. To raise your hand in Zoom on your computer, go to participants and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak by the chair, each person will preface your comments by giving your first and last name and street address. Anyone wishing to address the board on the subject matter of the agenda shall li limit your remarks to three minutes if time allows, you may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion of the chair if and only if you have a new and different point to make or question to ask on the topic. And again, we'll review that to see uh, how we're running for time this evening. Uh, the board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of each agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Everyone present at the public hearing uh, is requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at the hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. During your public comments, we ask that you also conduct yourself in a civil and courteous manner with constructive questions or comments. Speakers should address questions through me, the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with ARB members or other hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing and will be addressed at the discretion of the chair. So at this time, 
we will uh, go ahead and open the public hearings for 2022 town meeting. We will begin with Article 38, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for two family construction allowed by right in the R0 and R1 residential zones. This was inserted by the request of Annie Lacourt and 10 registered voters. So to begin, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny Rate to see if um, there are any questions or excuse me, any comments um, related to the memo prepared by the Department of Planning and Community Development. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I, first of all, I'm Jenny Rate. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. I'm joined by my colleague, Kelly Linema, who is the Assistant Director. And the two of us are available to answer any questions that the board members might have about the memo that we provided, which outlines um, you know, the consideration that the board might take for each one of the warrant articles that are being heard this evening. So I think I'll, I'll defer to the board to see if there are any questions or comments on the memo. But I did wanna say a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that this particular zoning bylaw amendment is subject to Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 5 such that this zoning bylaw may be enacted by a simple majority vote rather than the two thirds supermajority vote that applies to other zoning amendments. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, and second, I actually wanted to invite Steve Revelak to make a couple of comments before we um, entertain the board's questions on the memo, if there are any. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Steve. Okay. Uh Thank you, Madam Director. Um, I just wanted to, a few weeks ago, Ms. LaCourt appeared before the board to discuss her proposal with us. And during, the, during that discussion, one of, a, one of my colleagues on the board said, you know, this seems like a proposal we've had before. And you know, I noted that I had filed a similar proposal, or, or actually I'd worked with a, work with a colleague of mine who filed a similar proposal. Uh, I think back in 2020. Um, now, although Ms. LaCourt's is substantially similar, I just wanted to point out that this is her article. Um, you know, she, went, she, as far as I know, and Ms. LaCourt, I encourage you to correct me if this is wrong, but this was, um, you know, you filed this on your own initiative, you got your own signatures. Um, mine is not one of them. And I will, um, you know, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. That is it. Thank you, Madam Director. Thank you, Steve. Jenny, any additional comments? No, that was all. I'll be happy to take any questions or comments from the board on the memo that the department prepared. Great. Thank you, Jenny. So I'll run through uh, the board members to see if anyone has any specific questions for Jenny or Kelly, starting with uh, Ken. Not at this time. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, thank you for the very comprehensive um, discussion of this warrant article. Um, I don't have any questions. I, ha I have a comment, but I'll wait until um, we hear the presentation by the uh, um, by Ms. LaCourt or someone else who's filed the article. Great. Thank you, Jean. Melissa, any questions on the uh, memo from the department? Um, no questions. I'll listen to the presentation as well, but I do encourage um, everyone to read that memo if you haven't, if you're you know, following um, Article 38. Thank you, Melissa. And Steve, any questions uh, for the department on the memo? No questions, but just a, a comment. Um, in the portion of the memo which reproduces the main motion, it looks like there is some strikeout text that didn't come through as strikeout. Um, at least on my copy, it is correct in the, or, or there's, there's a difference between, uh, there's, a, there's strikeout text in the set of, um, in the set of main motions that was distributed or published on February 17th that I, um, it looks like they might not, it, it's a Scribner's thing. Um, they, it looks like it may not have come through in, in this, uh, in the memo. That's all. 
we will we will look into that further steve thank you for flagging it great thank you um and before i turn this over to uh annie laporte for a um her presentation i do want to remind the board members that if there are any questions which the petitioner doesn't have an answer for this evening um we because we have several nights of hearing of hearings ahead of us, um, we can certainly ask um, Ms. LaCourt or any future petitioners to um, come back with us to us with those answers before we deliberate and, and vote on April 4th. So I just wanted to make sure that I gave that reminder. Um, and I believe Annie LaCourt is with us this evening. And Annie, if you wanted to go ahead, um, I think we have allotted about six minutes for the presentation. So okay. take it away. Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this hearing tonight. I would like to mention that um, uh, Laura Wiener, who has worked on this article with me and been a great deal of help to me in understanding housing and zoning, is also here. Um, and um, so we're both here to answer questions or uh, help field whatever's going on. Um, so I'm proposing that we allow two families by right in all of the residential zoning districts in Arlington. Um, a considerable portion of the land in Arlington is uh, restricted to single family development. Um, what I've been seeing happen is that in neighborhoods where multifamily dwellings or duplexes can't be built, that we are seeing very large buildings being built as single families. And my hope by proposing this would be that we see more units built, uh, more modest units built, things that we might call the missing middle. Um, although I recognize they will not be tiny um, given um, the other rules around zoning on lots. Um, and that this provides some housing flexibility and it also is an environmentally sustainable move because more housing built in Arlington near transit is uh, housing built for people who are going to use their personal vehicles less, less um, uh, uh, burning of gas, less traveling uh, in individual cars, and um, that it increases housing choice, both for the residents who already live here and for people who are trying to move into town. So it, it offers the opportunity for young families that may struggle to purchase the average single family home in Arlington now, to have uh, additional options in terms of condo availability. It diversifies our neighborhoods. It makes it possible for those of us who've lived here for a long time who might want to downsize to consider the option of moving into a smaller unit in our same neighborhoods. Um, and two families, um, just to get back to the environmentally sustainable issue, two families are also more energy efficient generally than a single unit building. So that was what I was thinking when I decided to propose this article. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Kelly. So um, as I said, two family zoning is better for the environment. Smaller homes in shared structures have a lower carbon footprint. Uh, more, more houses on a smaller piece of land mean that um, we uh, are less strung out, less sprawl, so on and so forth. Um, Arlington is a great community in part because it is so close to uh, job centers and public transportation. So it's a good place to uh, increase housing uh, in terms of sustaining the environment. This is really an article that is about housing choice, flexibility in our zoning code, uh, investment in this community and um, expansion of who can live in this community. It is not necessarily an article about affordable housing with a capital A. I don't believe any of these units will be built at 80 or 60% of area median income and qualify for um, you know, any kind of subsidy, so on and so forth, but they will take some pressure off the market and they will offer um, uh, many people who wanna move here and many people who are already living here some options. Um, we can go to the next slide. So in what we're proposing, um, the building that would be built on, a, on a, a lot that might have two units in it will not be larger than the single family home allowed on that same lot. We're not changing any of the setbacks. We're not changing any of the height restrictions. We're not changing any of the required open space 
so on and so forth. So we're expecting structures that meet all of our current zoning restrictions in single family neighborhoods, just with two units in them instead of one. Uh, non-conforming lot restrictions also remain the same. So for example, my house is on a non-conforming lot, which means that I can't expand the footprint of my house beyond what is here without a special permit. Um, so they're already two families in the R0 and R1 districts. I added a lot of slides at the end of this particular presentation to show you some of those two families. We don't necessarily need to look at them tonight unless people ask, but I wanted the board to understand my thinking about this. A two family is sort of a standard unit of housing in Arlington. This isn't exotic for us or unusual or different. There are two families all over town. There are many two families within walking distance of my house, which is in, uh, you know, right across the street from Stratton School. Um, I do think that any change is going to be gradual. Um, I checked this, these statistics with Kelly last week, and we have been averaging about 27 teardowns a year. That's 27, you know, uh, completely rebuilt homes. Um, we have seen an increase this year, but last year we had almost no teardowns. So we think that's just an increase based on pent up demand. But I suspect that most of those teardowns are actually within walking distance of my house. It seems like every other house is coming down and all of them are being built into very, very large single family homes. And I personally would love to see some of those single family homes be two units and for us to have more families in a neighborhood that I love with more kids attending the school that my children attended. Um, so in conclusion, I think this is a simple change that could have a meaningful impact on uh, housing availability in Arlington. I think it increases our housing choices and it encourages sustainable, sustainable development. And I think it's a great investment in the future of our community to allow this kind of flexibility in our zoning code that will uh, allow people to stay in Arlington through the full life cycle and also make it easier for folks who are not current residents to possibly get a foothold in our community and become contributing members to our community. And that, with that, I conclude. Great, thank you very much, Annie. I appreciate the presentation. Um, I will now turn it over to um, members of the board for any questions that you might have for Annie. And we'll start with Ken. Hi, Annie. Um, I, I have uh, one question right now is, um, does this address parking uh, or it just remains uh, the same as is? So it doesn't address parking in the sense of expanding the allowable space for parking on the particular lot. Um, most of the single family homes that I'm seeing be built that have this same footprint are being built with two car garages and space for two cars to be parked in front of that. At least in my neighborhood, it's not unusual for um, a building that's built to the maximum allowable space on the lot to also have parking for four vehicles. So I, I just believe that um, it, it wouldn't be different for a two family structure since the structure is not gonna take up a greater footprint on the lot and the available space for um, uh, parking in a garage would be similar. So you don't see this increasing traffic at all with more parking? It's just, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, all the setbacks requirements are, are would still apply. Yes. Um, all the, um, regulations for as far as a uh, closest to property lines, all that stuff would still apply. It's just uh, stays the same. Yes. I mean, there are single family homes in my neighborhood where on any given day, there are six cars parked in front of them. Yeah, I, I realize that. I'm just wondering how this addresses it. I'm not- uh, it, it doesn't. It assumes that whatever the restrictions on parking and, and uh, available you know, ability to use the lot to create parking, are the same for the two family as they would be for a single family. Thank you. Um, that's all I have for now, uh, Rachel. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean, any questions for Annie? Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I guess the first question is one for either Annie or um, Jenny or Kelly, and that is, um, the updated housing 
production plan recommends as a strategy exactly this allowing um, two family homes in single family zones. And I'm sort of wondering um, to Jenny, I guess, any thoughts about how that corresponds to this article and to Annie about, well, let's see Jenny first. No problem. Um, yes, uh, in the housing production plan that was adopted by the board, one of the strategies to address um, fair housing and access to housing um, and remove barriers uh, to housing is uh, the uh, recommendation to allow two families in single family zones um, and to consider that as being one strategy among many others uh, to increase housing affordability and availability. Um, that particular recommendation emerged from the Fair Housing Action Plan, which was completed last year, um, which looked at um, access to housing and barriers to affordable housing and fair housing in Arlington. And uh, some of the barriers include barriers to home ownership as, where, as well as barriers to rental housing for uh, specific uh, race, races, classes, um, and various uh, uh, protected classes of people in Arlington. Um, so this was one of those recommendations that came from the Fair Housing Action Plan and is now part of the Housing Production Plan. And I just, for Annie, I wonder if you took that into consideration in this article? So actually, Jean, <laughs> this, is, this is classical court behavior. Um, when I decided that I was gonna file this article, I sort of was like, oh, look, I've had this brilliant idea nobody else has had. And it turns out that's not true. So I didn't know it was in the housing production plan at the time that I proposed this. And I also didn't know that it had been proposed in the past. Um, but I think I have benefited from the work that was done by folks on the housing production plan and by uh, the previous proponents work uh, in sort of formulating my thinking about this. And also seriously from uh, the time that Laura Wiener, uh, who used to work in our planning department, spent with me, helping me kind of understand the technicalities. Um, thanks. So second question is, um, I'm, I'm, I guess, concerned that we'll end up with, in, in many cases, with two fairly large living units or housing units, let's say, on the space. And I'm thinking that what I would like to see for this warrant article, and, and I raised this, I should say, at the zoning bylaw working group meeting last week, where it was pretty much favorably received, would be to limit the size of the units that would be created to 1,850 square feet of heated living space. Mm -hmm. And I came up with that number because under state law, it's the maximum size for what's called a quote unquote starter home. Mm -hmm. And I think if what we're trying to do, and I agree with you as an aside, mm -hmm. you know, considering how much land prices are mm -hmm. and how much construction costs are, these are not gonna be affordable to low income people. But I think if we limited um, the size of the units consistent with the starter home um, requirements, then we would be depressing the price of the unit somewhat, and then it would more likely fulfill one of the goals, which is to create more missing middle housing. So I wondered if you had or would give that some thought as a possibility. So I have a couple of questions about that, and I don't know if now is the time to ask questions of you. Or to... I'm happy to try to answer them. Okay. That would be great, Annie. Yep. And if there are just for process wise too, if there are questions which Jean has that the two of you need to follow up on following this meeting, that is certainly something that we can great. do as well. And we have offered to any person coming in front of the, the board in the past to, to um, basically have a, a board member work with them on any revisions that might be suggested that come out of today's meeting. 
So the first question I have, Jean, is are you talking about restricting the size of units in a two family to 1,850 square feet in R1 and R0 or in all residential districts? No, in R1 and R0, because that's what your um, warrant article is about, and it couldn't be expanded to include any of the other districts. Right. But if you could restrict the size of the of multifamily units like this of two and three family units in the other districts, would you do it? Because it I, seems to me like it's going I to have, be hard to have an inconsistent code. Uh, I, I'd have to think I'd have to think that through. I'm, I'm not sure there's some I can see your point. On the other hand, the point is when you're allowing something that's not currently allowed right. in a district, you might want to put restrictions on it that you wouldn't put elsewhere in the town. So I'm not sure. But this article is not about the rest of the districts. All right. So we don't have to worry about that. And then my other question is, if what we really want is to uh, create more smaller units, then uh, it would seem to me that the way to do that is to expand the number of units allowed so that within the footprint that's allowable in our single family districts, you could actually build more smaller units um, rather yes, than- that's, you, but, Andy, uh, that's not what you proposed. It is not and what I proposed. It's not what you proposed. And then, it, you know, I've read every one of the comments mm -hmm. that came in yep. and it would just exacerbate, I think what a lot of people's concerns are as, as you, if you were to allow more than two units in these buildings. So, yeah, so I, you know, I guess I'm sort of asking if you and, and the other people who, you know, had signed on to your warrant article would give consideration to this um, amendment for your warrant article. So I'm not, I'm not 100% certain what the process is here, okay? So the way that I had imagined it was that I was going to propose this warrant article. I was going to propose a, uh, a, a final vote and that you were going to decide whether or not you supported the article and you were going to, as a board, write the final vote. So it would seem to me that if the board decides that they want to restrict the size of these units and put it in the vote that they take, um, that that's what we get. If well, you're asking me whether if you're asking me whether or not I think it's a good idea, I okay. don't. But okay. you know, I don't see it as a hostile move, and I don't want to. So unless I'm wrong about if select board, that would be. Let me, yeah. <laughs> let, let me just clarify the process. Then what I'd like to do is to take all questions and and comments such as Jean's um, that we have from the board members, um, listen to the the public comments, and then circle back and identify any comments like Jean's that um, are requesting you to consider any potential um, changes to the okay. amendment as proposed to see if that's something that you'd be willing to um, entertain between now and when the, the board votes on April 4th. So if that works, yeah. Gina, what I'd like to do is just table that question until, we, um, until we're finished with public comment. That yeah. sounds like a good thing to do. Thanks so much, yeah. Rachel. Okay. So yeah, I'll I'll stop at this point. And you can Great. It sounds on. like a very collaborative way to approach this, Rachel, and it's sort of what I was expecting. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Any any questions for um, for Annie on the proposed foreign article? Annie, thank you for your proposal. Um, I guess I was just curious about any residential design guidelines, if that had been given any consideration um, through your thinking and, and kind of the development of this proposal. Um, partly I asked because, you know, some of the comments that I've received and some that came in in writing have been really concerned about form, sizing, and mass um, as well. So I think um, I was curious on you know, what your thinking is on that as a proponent. So my thinking had been to keep this as simple as possible. And I would assume that all standards that apply to single family homes being built in, uh, uh, you know, torn down and built on the, the same properties that we're discussing um, would apply to two families. 
So to the extent that the design guidelines are imposed on single family homes, they should be imposed on two family homes, duplexes, you know, whatever is, is uh, being built by a developer. Um, I've read the guidelines. I've walked around my neighborhood. I don't see any projects being built in my neighborhood that are applying the guidelines. I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Melissa. I, um, I do see our building commissioner on here and I was just wondering if he could speak to that um, and just to help me understand um, what the control is on the size under this proposal. Control is for the, the size of the- Yeah, the, the massing and how he would see this playing out. Uh, great, I'm happy to, to turn that over to um, Mike Champa who is with us this evening. Thank you. I'm Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. I'm sorry, Melissa. So you'd like to know um, how the sizing restriction would play out? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like a lot of the concern is either McMansion or now in, um, with regard to two family, it would just be, you know, kind of still maximizing the building envelope with two family on one site. I think that's generally what I've heard is a concern. And I'm just trying to understand from your perspective if, the, if that would continue is it, or is it just because that the proposal doesn't have those details it's saying as is, is there anything else that we should know that could be exploited here that we're missing? No, I mean, I think that so R1 and R2 have the same um, lot sizes. Um, so it, it, you know, you would just be, um, you know, they would be building the same size house, but you would be getting two units. Um, I think the RO gets a little trickier if there's not a restriction um, be, because of the size of the lot, you know, they, they could build bigger homes. They, it could, you know, two large homes, but i um, I'm not sure where the um, I'm not sure where the happy medium is that it makes it a project that's worth doing for someone uh, size wise as well. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, um, Annie. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, any other questions or are you good at this time? I'm good at this time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Steve, any questions for uh, for Annie? Um, no, just actually um, sort of a follow-up. I'd like to follow up briefly to something Mr. Benson mentioned. Um, you know, we did discuss this article at the Zoning Bylaw Working Group and you know, the, um, you know, the practicality of imposing uh, size limitations. Now, I did ask pose a question to, to staff earlier today is in terms of how many starter homes were been built under 40R. And I understand the number is very small. Um, so I think, you know, for us as a board, it would be, you know, possibly worth investigating that if, you know, we continue down that line of discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, Anna, I just have one question for, for you um, before we open this up to public comment. My question is, um, you know, given the discussion that we've had both tonight, tonight and, I, and I'm sure we're about to have with the public and, and when this same topic has come before us, um, you know, one of the things that I see as potentially necessary is, um, you know, a real education mm -hmm. plan in terms of the way that this, should this go forward, um, that this be discussed with, with town meeting members and precinct members um, ahead of town meetings so that they uh, understand um, what this article both proposes and more importantly doesn't pr propose in terms of the way that, that things might change. Um, have you given any thought to what an education plan might look like, you know, knowing when town election is and you know new town meeting members and and that that window there, I I, I just want to um, say that I think when there has been a strong education plan in place, um, mm -hmm. that um, that has been helpful 
for for town meeting members. So just wanted to see if that's something you have any thoughts on. I I haven't thought about it very much yet. I'm sort of taking it one step at a time. If the sure. ARP votes this article, then that would be the next step, which is to come up with an education plan, particularly for um, town meeting members about what this proposes and what it doesn't propose. Um, uh, you know, we usually hold a series of um, precinct meetings before town meeting now, and I would you know, be sure that I and other proponents of the article, other supporters showed up at those precinct meetings to answer questions. Um, I suspect it would probably behoove me to produce some written material that could be used, you know, FAQ or whatever for that purpose. Um, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not blithely assuming that this is either going to pass the ARB or pass town meeting. Um, it felt to me like it was something we needed to discuss. Thank you. I appreciate you addressing that. All right. Um, any additional questions for Annie from the board members before I open this up for public comment? All right. So at this time, I'd like to uh, open the uh, public comment period for Article 38. Uh, any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function. Um, at the bottom of the participants window. Um, please make sure to introduce yourself when you begin speaking by your first, last name and address. And note that you are um, allotted up to three minutes for your comments. Um, we will go ahead and um, take the uh, speakers in the order in which hands are raised, starting with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, this feels pretty much like it's a redux of what was pursued about two years ago in front of the town I meeting. Maybe it was three and failed pretty dramatically. Um, and I believe, in effect, what it is, and, I, and I'm not sure how folks are addressing it, but this is doing away with R0 and R1 zoning. It's not just allowing two families on R1, it's doing away with R1 and, and in effect doing away with R0. That's, uh, to my mind, what's being presented. Um, changes to the vision of Arlington, um, um, as, as with all vision adjustments, I think needs to be done with a scalpel. And I believe this is an effect to hacksaw. This is a huge change, it's not a small change. Um, and as I said, this when it came up two years ago, it, it, it failed as part of a package pretty dramatically. Uh, I, um, I think this would push a huge workload to the ZBA, which handles all special permits, because pretty much, I, I think many lots, maybe the majority of lots in Arlington for R0 and R1 are non-conforming. Um, for, for many reasons, be them size, be them setbacks, be them they've been grandfathered in as many two families have, have happened in, in R1 districts. Um, and that means the ZBA has to approve all of that. And that's a pretty big workload on top of what already is a, a pretty big workload for them. I heard during the presentation, a statement that it's unusual to see certain parking and such on, on, a, on a single okay. park. That doesn't mean it's typical. I think there would be serious parking implications for two families, um, two family parking uh, in single family areas. Um, not that it couldn't be dealt with, but there would be implications. Um, I think with Arlington lots being as small as they are, the only way to go is up. And that is a pretty dramatic change for the visual character of town. Um, and I don't know if it's a great way to go. Um, but, but again, this is food for thought as much as uh, anything, anything else. So to, to finish, I, I basically don't support this. Um, I think the way we need to go is to incentivize the building of two families, not impose changes to zoning that would push two family. I, I think we need to incentivize builders to do it since they're gonna make more money usually, but I believe with single families, though I'm clearly not an expert in this, in this area. 
So uh, I would just like to say I don't I don't think the uh, ARB should support this article as it's currently construed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next speaker uh, this evening will be John G from Boston. Uh, thank Henry. you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Gersh, uh, Kipling Road, town meeting member for Precinct 18. I have four questions. I will state them and uh, then take the answers while I listen. Uh, number one, um, would these two units each then be entitled to build an accessory dwelling unit? In effect, uh, a total of four units on each lot. Number two, uh, how would the existing residents of Arlington in these districts be notified uh, so as not to be blindsided by this uh, change? In other words, would they be treated as a butters with a butter letters and such, or is this going to continue to be R1 and they would not need to be notified uh, if they were not paying attention to these hearings? Number three, um, I'd like to know if there's any evidence that these new units would be more affordable than the existing single family homes that they are replacing. Um, if they um, would, yeah, if, if it makes uh, uh, any affordability sense uh, to, to replace with condos. And number four, uh, I would like to know, I, I heard, I think Ms. LaCourt say something about uh, residents would not maybe have as many cars. And I just would like to know if there's any evidence uh, to support that idea. I will uh, take my answer offline. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those questions. Um, I would like to um, ask Annie to um, respond to, I, I can actually respond to the first one, uh, maybe Jenny to number two, and then um, regarding affordability. Annie, I believe that you've already um, a, a address that in your in your um, in your notes, but if there's anything else you wanted to add, so the two units um, would in fact each be entitled to ADUs per the um, per for what was um, approved last year in terms of the, the ADU. Um, Jenny, would you like to speak to how existing residents would be notified? My, we're not changing the zoning of the existing in terms of what they're currently classified as. So I don't know that um, existing, I don't know that notification would be required, but Jenny, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Rachel. No, notification would not be required. The right. only time notification occurs um, in single and two family zones is if there's a special permit hearing through the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for a specific project. And then also people are notified when there's a good neighbor agreement um, attached to a project. And that's um, you know, sort of a, a different scale of abutter notices, but not, not the kind of notification that this um, individual is asking about that, John. Great, Great. thank you. Um, and Annie, is there anything else that you wanted to add regarding affordability? I know that um, that is, I'm sure a question that will come up uh, again, so if there's anything else you wanted to add at this time, I will hold um, further questions on that until the end. Um, but if there's anything else you wanted to add at this time, I'll go ahead and give you a minute to do so. I hopefully won't need a minute, Rachel. There's a lot of hands up. Um, I'm a, a, a big proponent of affordable housing, but this is not an affordable housing article. This is really an article about allowing for more starter home, missing middle. I mean, I, I recognize that particularly in R0, if you took the average lot and you built to the max, which is what people are doing when they're tearing down their houses, you're gonna end up with two very large units. Um, the, uh, but I, I would say that what's happening now is that houses are being built to the maximum size on the lot. And we're just getting a very large unaffordable single family home, I was hoping that this might encourage more duplexes and two families to be built that would allow for um, just sort of one slightly lower step on the ladder for families to be able to afford to move into Arlington to just sort of keep the cycle going. So. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, Jean, I see that you have your, your hand up. Do you have um, something you'd like to, to add? Yeah. Uh 
to, to John Gershu's question, and, and it, it, I'm sort of going to ask this to um, Jenny. Um, so while this would, I think, not change the rules on ADUs, one of the other rules, I believe, is that they still need to meet the setback and all of the other requirements. So if you're building these houses out to the size that you're allowed to have, they're not going to be able to stick an ADU on it. I wonder if Jenny thinks I interpreted that correctly. I want to clarify that you can't build an ADU if it's new, a new building. No, no, you can't build an ADU if doing so would go into the setbacks or exceed the FAR or reduce that's the amount correct. of open space available. That's correct. And there's also limitations on the size of the accessory dwelling units that's codified in the bylaw. Um, while there's no parking requirements for ADUs, the parking requirements for single and two are one space per dwelling. Um, those are the only different, that was sort of a differentiation there, but otherwise, no, um, to answer your question. Yeah, so I, I think that's the, the gloss I would add to the ADU thing, that while it's going to be available, if we assume that the builders are gonna to try to maximize the size of the place, it's unlikely that somebody's gonna come in later and be able to put an ADU on because they're gonna violate the bulk of the open space requirements. Great, thank you, Jean. I'm actually going, we have a lot of hands up, so I'm going to um, move on to the next uh, speaker. So uh, Jordan Weinstein. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for holding this meeting. Uh, Jordan Weinstein, uh, Lennon Road in Arlington, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 21. Um, I am opposed to this. Uh, yeah. If it were a, a bylaw that actually created more affordable housing, which in my mind is the only thing that would help drive down uh, uh, and take the pressure off the market in Arlington and also help diversify and allow uh, people who uh, can't afford uh, the rising cost of real estate here to come into the, into the region, into our town, I would support it. But this does nothing uh, to address that primary issue that we have with real estate here with housing. Uh, I don't agree with the logic uh, that's being presented for uh, even making this kind of a change uh, better for the environment. I don't see how a two family, how doubling the occupancy on the same plot of land is going to take uh, any pressure off the environment. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I can come up with arguments for why it would add more pressure to the environment, more use, uh, of uh, the utilities, uh, probably uh, uh, automobile use. Uh, and also, I think that there's an assumption here that really needs to be examined. The assumption that uh, building more and making more housing available will uh, help uh, ease the uh, pressure on the market. Let me give you a couple of examples of why this hasn't been the case. Uh, as a theory, maybe this works, but Don Seltzer published a great blog on the ARFRR uh, website, and he cited at least 10 examples, I'll, I'll only give you a few, of single family homes that were sold and then converted into condos, each condo selling for much more than the, the initial price of that single family home. Uh, one of them is one uh, from 9 to 11 Arnold Street, a single family home sold for $600, was converted to two condos. Each of those condos sold for nearly $900,000. Uh, 21 to 23 Beacon Street, $950 sale price of a single family home. One of the condos sold for 980,000, the other for 990,000. We can go back and actually get uh, and, and look at the actual data and not uh, you know, uh, present uh, theoreticals here. There's plenty of data. Um, to me, uh, it, it really is uh, uh, an act of, uh, would only enhance gentrification in Arlington. And as far as choice, it would not lower the pressure 
on the market. Uh, it would only create more unaffordable housing. And I, I think finally, it's really a giveaway to real estate and developer interests uh, who are interested more in profits than people or our community. I think we ought to be focusing our attention on true affordable housing here in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Thank you, I'm Carl Wagner. I live at uh, 30 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. And I was born here, moved away, and then like a lot of newer people, moved back and discovered how Arlington has this wonderful spot between the urban and the suburb. And it's neither of those, but it contains all of those two. Plus it has extra features. We have uh, some of the most diverse housing in the area. And we're also more affordable than all the towns and cities that surround us, except for, uh, except for Medford. The, the proponent is, is trying to add housing. I think it's very important to note that the same uh, article came to the town and came to this, this ARB just a year or two ago. And it, it, as was said earlier, it, it was turned down because it didn't match the needs of what Arlington needs. It doesn't help affordability. It doesn't help our climate resiliency. It gets rid of green spaces. It doesn't help uh, the housing stock diversity. It goes on and on to the point where you realize, like Mr. Weinstein just said, what it does is it makes housing choice for people who don't live here yet. And don't you as volunteers of this board and the people in the planning department and in our town uh, official status, don't those people have to work for the, the benefits and the needs of the people who live here already? Or to work for making it more affordable for the people who don't live here yet. And this would make housing choice for higher income people at the higher price point. It would probably do nothing at all for affordable, even if, uh, uh, if Mr. Benson's uh, proposal came in, but it will definitely eviscerate the middle income housing, the middle stock of the housing. And I ask you therefore to turn this down. I further have a question. I would like people to realize who are here tonight that, that the proponents of the article uh, a year or two ago, as was mentioned, uh, are, include one of the members of the ARB. And I hope that, um, that uh, you will recuse yourself since you already said two years ago uh, that you want to be uh, going for this very thing. I think it's, it's really immoral to have an ARB commissioner uh, vote yes or no on something that he's already stated very recently. He wants the same thing to happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just state that there is absolutely no reason for any member of the ARB to recuse themselves uh, during this, um, no matter what they've been involved with with regard to past, um, past Warren articles. We have been invited um, any member of the public in Arlington to work together with the ARB um, to, to, to help to solidify um, the Warren articles as they're trying to put them together. And um, you know, we had Annie come in front of the ARB um, earlier in this year, many other proponents. Um, and that's, again, something that's open to any member of the public to work together um, for for the preparation of any one of these Warren articles. The next speaker this evening will be Wynnell Evans. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, Wynnell Evans, Orchard Place and Town Meeting Member Precinct 14. I very much appreciate the intent of this article to provide housing choice, but I, I agree with previous speakers that the choice that it would provide would be entirely for buyers who can afford million dollar plus homes and it would remove choice for everyone else by further incentivizing the demolition of our older and less expensive houses. In 2020, this board voted no action on a similar article, noting that there was not yet, quote, a clear understanding of the impact of similar rezonings due to the recent nature of similar zoning changes in other states, unquote. This concern hasn't been addressed yet, but really all we have to do is look at what happens here when single families are replaced with duplexes. In every single case, each new unit sells for several thousand more than the demolished single family and sometimes for close to twice its price. Now, one justification for this article I've heard is that by providing more market rate housing, we alleviate some of the competition for lower priced houses. 
But 2021 data from the MLS says that houses listing at 1 million and up averaged 12 days on the market and sold for well over their asking prices, while those listing at 750,000 and lower sat for 26 days and sold for close to their listing prices. In other words, the competition is for the more expensive houses. And this makes sense. People who can afford those prices don't want fixer uppers. They don't want to put sweat equity into a house. They want new, big, and ready to move into. And while those older homes that are targeted may be smaller and in need of work, they still provide an opportunity for someone like myself, this is how I moved here, to get a foothold in our housing market. Their replacements remove choice while driving up home prices and land values, which will lead to an eventual rise in property taxes. This affects existing homeowners of more modest means and those on fixed incomes and also renters as their landlords pass along these costs. All these people are being pushed out of town. Arlington is meeting the needs of higher income buyers. It's middle and lower income buyers that are shut out. This proposal, while well-intentioned, would have the exact opposite effect of what it hopes to accomplish. Finally, the ARB also expressed concerns about, quote, a lack of public engagement, unquote, regarding the 2020 version of this article. This likewise has not been addressed yet. Several months ago, this board heard a proposal to rezone several areas along Mass Ave. The board was united and insistent that the proponent must contact every affected property owner. And town council told the proponent that he must notify abutters to the affected areas. Will the proponents of Article 38 likewise be required to provide notice to all property owners and abutters of R0 through one districts? I believe that they should. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be James Fleming. Sorry, getting everything set up. Does that work now? It does. We can see you and hear you. Fantastic. James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. Uh, I'd like to speak in favor of this article. Most of the redevelopment that I see in town, just you just build out to the max because there's a market for it. People want it. Um, and if you build out to the max, you're going to get whatever that is. It doesn't matter how many units are in it. As a, I see a couple of advantages to doing multiple units. If you have a two family instead of a one family, the tax base is larger and that new unit doesn't require any additional roads or water or sewer lines to support it. And for schools, like we can support the student population we have. So really our tax rate and base, everything that seems to cover it. That's not really an issue. And then if you have more residents, you can also support local businesses better. Of the three districts we have, the Heights is the one that struggles the most with vacancies. It might help to have more residents nearby to support those businesses. For affordability, there's nothing that's going to happen to slow that the effect that our own is going to be less affordable over time. You would, you would never say that Beacon Hill would be an affordable place for someone to live. Only the wealthy can live there. Arlington is becoming that, and there's nothing you can do to stop it unless you subsidize housing, which is, frankly, it's very slow and it's expensive. So that's why there isn't a lot of it. The only upside to this is that it's good for the town because you have more taxes, and it's good for some of the residents who can move in because you would now you have people who can afford million dollar houses instead of $2 million houses. So you whatever little economic diversity you have left, at least you have that as opposed to nothing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be John Warden. My name is John. I'm not John Warden. Uh, I thought you okay. called John Warden. John Warden, yes, John Warden. Okay. Go right. ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can, yep. Oh, thank you. All right, uh, John Warden, uh, Jason Street, town meeting member. Um, I, I, at first, I, 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 I oh, oh, yes. Um, my, my wife, uh, Patricia Warden, uh, uh, would also like to speak at some point. Uh, we don't seem to be able to find a way to get both of us separately on your list. So we're doing this as we had done at a previous meeting. That's fine. Uh, um, John, if you could have Patricia speak right after you, that would be great. Well, I'm sure she's 
she probably bled, would rather speak before me, but, but, but anyway, my name's on the list. Thank you. Um, all right, first, um, uh, on the materials that the, uh, the uh, uh, planning department made uh, on, on your website, uh, there was a, a vast number of photographs of um, two family houses in single family zones, a couple of which are neighbors of mine. Um, and they were all marked page after page of illegal houses. And whoever put that together, uh, I, I'm, I'm appalled that they don't understand the difference between an illegality, which is a structure that's built without a permit, and a pre-existing non-conforming use, uh, which was built under a permit or before we had before we had zoning, uh, and uh, that his grandfather did, as was mentioned before. And and I, I'm also I'm really uh, quite mystified how the professional staff, which surely understands the difference, would let something go on the on the ARB or, or the planning department website. Uh, that, that contain that uh, that confusing and, 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 and incorrect language. So I, I, I would ask that, that that sort of thing not happen in the future. Um, just a couple points. This is a terrible article. Uh, it, it was rejected before, it should be rejected again. You, are, you already have uh, the right to have a two family house in a single family zone. It's, but you call it an ADU and you can have that ADU expand beyond its 400 and for 750 feet by getting a special permit. So what you're asking for now is the ability to create four family houses in the R R1 and R0 districts. Uh, and, and that's totally over the top. The, the master plan, the master plan which has been adopted by the town meeting after very extensive public participation over a long period of many months says there, there are two kinds of housing that we should have in Islington. And that would be affordable housing and senior housing. Now at the zoning bylaw working group of which I am a member, I brought this, I brought this point up and, uh, and uh, nobody said anything about senior housing. I guess they don't think that, that you're not gonna get old like I am. I, I think you probably will. Maybe you won't be able to afford to live in Arlington anymore. Uh, but affordable housing was scoffed at. Oh, they, you can't afford to build affordable housing. Well. Wait a minute, we're talking about developer profits. You can't afford to do it if you're gonna, uh, if you're gonna charge uh, the kind of money that they're charging and getting for these houses. So th th that, that, that's, that, that's just a, a false error. And if they, can't, if they can't follow the master plan, then we shouldn't be doing it. So I, I, I would urge you to, uh, to, to, to reject this and, and, and uh, the, the, if it's bad enough what's happening, to this, the small, marginally affordable, well-built, I just want to say well-built, houses built before the war, before World War II, are well-built housing materials. You're a time. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. And what I'd like to um, clarify, uh, the, the document that John Warden was referring to was prepared by the uh, petitioner, not by the Department of Planning and Community Development. Uh, so Patricia Warden, uh, I will go ahead and um, turn to you now, if you could introduce yourself and I'll yeah. start your time. Thank you, Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. I have worked for 30 years on affordable housing. Article 38 is not about affordable housing. It is about providing lucrative development opportunities for developers with its Orwellian language and proposed changes, it feeds the appetite for profit developers to continue their documented teardowns of reasonably affordable homes and replacement with much more expensive units. It entirely violates the master plan. The article is extremely discriminatory and racist and should be rejected out of hand if we are to retain our cherished housing equity and diversity in Arlington. Uh, the article proponents are trying to make a profound and tragic policy decision for Arlington, which deserves publicity to all citizens and taxpayers. 
um, it, it is essentially, it eliminates much lower income people of all races from the Arlington housing market. There is nothing in this proposed bylaw for them, nothing. It also hurts the so-called missing middle buyer from Arlington, contrary to what the Article 38 proponents claims, our teachers, service providers, etc., are priced out of units that this article will bring. If you study the logistics of likely consequences in Arlington, you will find that um, any affordability will be a thing of the past, except what Arlington Housing Authority can provide. The new housing units will have prices for those earning more than 200% of area median income. Also, um, proponents of Article 38 claim that nothing can be done to prevent teardowns and replacements with expensive homes, but those same proponents opposed development of a temporary moratorium on teardowns of capes and opposed every one of the many attempts by citizens at last year's town meeting to prevent teardowns and increase affordability of our housing. If nothing can be done, that's because they choose not to do anything. Some weeks ago, the planning department assured you, the members of the redevelopment board, that before any of the strategies of the housing plan were to be promoted and enacted with zoning changes, it would first be vetted by appropriate town groups, including the select board, but that has not been done. One Thank you, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Wendy Richter. Hi, um, my name is Wendy Richter. I live on Brattle Place in Arlington. Um, a lot of the points that I was going to bring up have been mentioned, and I just want to highlight them. Um, the um, unintended consequences of this, I could, I think, could be uh, detrimental to the town in that um, units that are uh, affordable to the missing middle as they are now um, may be lost with teardowns. And we see this a lot in the two family zone where smaller, uh, even smaller two families are replaced with much larger two families. So I feel very strongly that if it, the, the, inten the intention of this um, warrant article, which is to increase more uh, housing units that are um, not affordable in the technical term of affordable, but are not um, high-end housing, that there needs to be incentivized some way, smaller units. And um, I think that um, tying uh, development of two units on a single family lot to um, uh, adhere to the residential guidelines might be a, a way to incentivize those guidelines and give a developer something, you know, that is a, a, an alternative to building a large house. But I think that it needs, it would need review. And um, one of the concerns that I have in this is if the one, one family zone lots um, have to conform with single family zoning, um, zoning is there more than one front door? Because I think that changes the nature of a neighborhood. And I'm not saying that you can't have a two family because there are two families that are developed where you have a primary residence and a secondary residence. And I see that as uh, something would be more um, fit in better in the single family neighborhoods. But I think that it, take, it will take more um, development of this uh, uh, proposal to, um, and it would probably involve more uh, review and oversight. Um, and I just think that there's a lot more that needs to go into it before it's ready ready um, to, be, to be voted on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Elizabeth Pyle. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Pyle. I live at 66 Gloucester Street. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 8. I'm also a zoning and land use attorney, and I've been practicing in those fields for more than 20 years. And I was a member of Arlington's residential zoning study group, the RSG, 
which for three years studied the issue of new construction in the residential districts and what the impacts of those uh, new houses would be on the community. And I can say that my single biggest takeaway from being on the residential study group was that homes that were single family but located in the two family districts were targets for teardown rebuilds and that these new homes that were built were bigger, more expensive and built to the maximum envelope possible, which were always very large houses and bigger than what was replaced. And if this article were to come into effect, this article 38, we could see the same kind of impacts throughout town. And I oppose this article because the impact of it would be to put Arlington more out of reach for people from diverse communities. This would remove uh, existing housing opportunities at the six hundred dollars to $700,000 range or in the middle range and replace it with only luxury units. And although the um, proponents of the article, their intent is to make more housing choice, the article would actually have the opposite effect and have less housing choice. And one of the things that um, the RSG, we, we always talked about was the potential for unintended consequences caused by major zoning changes and how important it was to fully vet changes with all stakeholders. So um, unintended consequences that were negative to the community would not happen. And I've heard many examples of these kind of unintended consequences come up tonight. The impact on green space, the impact on massing, um, the potential for uh, parking problems, for having ADUs on the lot, that um, these, these impacts have not been fully vetted such that this article is not ready to go forward at this time. And Arlington, by a, removing single family zoning, would be um, the first and only municipality in the state to take such a drastic action. Arlington should wait and see how these kind of impacts play out nationwide and in other communities to see if they actually work and have the impact that proponents say that they might have because many scholars think that they'll have the opposite impact, less affordability, less choice, and a lot of unintended consequences. So I would urge the board to um, reject the article, to vote no action, more study and public outreach is needed on these important issues. Um, this article would lead to greater gentrification, has not been fully vetted. Thank and, you for um, your time. Thank you very much for, for your time tonight. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Don Seltzer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I'm going to try to answer the question of how many, just how many homes will be affected by this zoning change. References have been made to the 2019 report on demolitions. I remember when it was presented to the residential study group and they refused to endorse it. It was based upon the mistaken notion that only those homes smaller than 1500 square feet and built before 1980 were candidates for teardowns. It was a poor discriminator at the time and is even more outdated now. In actuality, any single family lot of 5,000 square feet or more and worth 850K or less would become a target for teardown and conversion to a duplex condo for which each unit would sell for about a million or more in today's market. Nearly half of the single family homes in R0, R1 fall within these criteria. What would this mean for a specific R1 neighborhood such as Stratton, our most racially diverse school? It is predominantly comprised of these types of homes, affordable to the middle third of Arlington households, making between $100,000 and $200,000. These are the kind of homes that are affordable for our first responders and for two teacher households. As an example, one such home, 2,200 square feet and built after 1980, sits only a block away from Stratton. It sold just a year ago for $780,000. If this warrant article were in effect, it would likely have been 
bought up instead by a developer to tear down and replace with more expensive condos, crowding up against its neighbors and the front yard dug up for a steep double driveway leading to garages under. This board has been provided with the recent teardown and conversion history in the R2 districts. In every instance, a single family home was replaced with condos, each costing more than the original home. The net impact of this warrant article will be to remove choice for middle income families and instead provide more choice to households making 200% or more of AMI. Despite the intentions of its sponsors, it will not create more affordable housing and it will further erode the economic and racial diversity of Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Michelle. Hi, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to say I'm a new resident, but I've been here for a few years. And I heard Annie talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Would you mind introducing yourself with your first, last name and address? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Michelle Nathan, I'm a Robin Hood Road that's, you know, borders you. Mystic Lakes. Thank you. Um, so I heard the woman, Annie, who proposed the um, article talk about in her neighborhood that she sees housing guidelines are not followed. And I unfortunately have seen the same thing in Arlington. And I wonder since guidelines aren't followed and there'll be a lot of development, how will guidelines be ensured um, to be followed? And also I don't understand why developers when they apply for permits don't put the true cost of construction. So they pay less in permitting fees. I don't know why that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker this evening will be Kristen Anderson. Thank you, uh, Kristen Anderson, 12 Upland Road West. Um, I am a Precinct 13 town meeting member. Uh, my concerns um, are of environmental health, uh, specifically regarding stormwater runoff. Stormwater is a waste product Rainwater, on the other hand, is a resource when it is absorbed by trees and vegetation and when it is able to percolate back into the soil um, and recharge groundwater. So um, with this in mind, I have a couple questions. Um, how will this zoning change affect the amount of pervious surface that we have in Arlington on a per lot basis? So what I mean by that is, let's say we've got a single family um, lot that, uh, uh, that is redeveloped, um, turned into a two family with a couple of ADUs. Um, what is the estimated loss of pervious surface? And secondly, how many trees will be cut down in each lot that is developed in the event, um, that this article passes? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll let you guys answer that. Uh, thank you, Kristen. What I'd like to do is hold that question. I'm not sure that the applicant can answer that today, um, but I will save that for the end and um, ask, ask okay. that they respond. May, may I say something else about this then, since there, this is going to be the end of the discussion on it. Yeah. Um, this, is a ter this is a terribly important issue, and we tend to overlook stormwater runoff. Uh, unless development is happening in the floodplain, which is really unfortunate. And we have flooding problems in this town. And we also have uh, problems with uh, hazardous contaminated water in our water bodies. And so when we talk about how this warrant article is gonna be good for the environment, I, I really think that this needs to be addressed. So um, I'm, I'm disappointed that no one has even considered this as of yet. Are you sure that the, that the proponent has not thought of this? I, I do not know, but I'm going to hold that question for the end when we circle back to the discussion. Okay. So All I, right. Thank you. I appreciate your concern. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be uh, Ann El Ellert. Hi, I am Ann Ehlert. I live on Westminster Avenue. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 21. Um, and I respect um, Annie's goals with this warrant article. Um, however, I have a lot of concerns for the impact on the town. I, a lot of people have already discussed my concerns. So I wanna just focus on the ones I think we might need a little more discussion on. And, and that's increased density is something I've heard a lot about from the town, but the residents I know really are not in favor of increased density for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and the other thing I think that hasn't really been discussed tonight is the impact on property taxes. If density increases, which I think it will over time because the property will be more valuable and developers will come in, then this puts a lot of pressure on the schools and the infrastructure. And we already have spent, you know, are spending $300 million on rebuilding the high school. We've had to in the last few years take over a school because of the increased enrollment. And what happens is like these big jumps when you um, no longer can fit into the school buildings are really gonna increase property taxes. And this is maybe a little bit outside it, but one thing I've noticed being a town meeting member is that, that there really isn't a process for the town to um, figure out and communicate the, the impact on our infrastructure for some of these warrant articles. And I think it's huge. I, th I think this could make, you know, over time, even the ADU thing, if that takes off and, you know, allowing two families by right can really increase the property taxes and make the town less affordable, even for the people who already live here. Um, the other thing I just want to remind people of is that anytime we have a zoning change that only requires 50% vote to to implement it, it still takes a two thirds vote to reverse it. So we need to be really careful about putting the, these things forth to town meeting. Oops. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Rebecca Peterson. Hello, um, this is, uh, I'm Rebecca Peterson. I live on Florence Ave. Um, I, I urge you to categorically reject the elimination of single family zoning in Arlington. Um, I think Arlington appeals to buyers primarily because it has a suburban feel, uh, but with urban conveniences. We, we have good restaurants, we're close to the T, we're close to Boston, but eliminating single family housing will destroy the very thing that drew most people here. I think this proposal is patently unfair to people who saved to buy a house specifically in a single family neighborhood. Most people who bought in single family neighborhoods didn't do that by accident. And so, you know, those of us who have done that have spent the subsequent years paying for our homes and improving them. So I would respectfully ask you, what about people who want to live in a single family neighborhood? Do we matter? I wish we could stop demonizing single family homes. Is the only goal to stuff as many people as we possibly can inside the town borders? Many of us do not want to live somewhere as dense as Cambridge. I don't. You know, I appreciate the town-like feel of Arlington with the yards and the trees. In addition, as other people have mentioned, in eliminating single-family housing does absolutely nothing for truly affordable housing, but it is a dream, on the other hand, for the teardown crowd and the developers. The constant push from the town for increased density is really tiresome. People who live here, if you, if you look at the comments tonight, it's overwhelmingly people do not want this. We should be trying to protect what little green space we have and maintain our quality of life rather than encouraging people to build on every square inch possible. So I really hope that you'll pay attention to the vast majority of residents here tonight who are speaking against this article. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be Matthew Owen. Hi, I'm Matthew Owen. Um, I'm at 164 Forest Street. Um, and I'd like to speak in favor of this draft warrant article. Um, I think one thing in this discussion tonight that sort of hasn't been foregrounded a lot um, is there been these comparisons between you know how much 
um, a single family home cost that was redeveloped into a duplex and what each of those units cost. But I'd like to give some ex examples of what the cost differences are um, in currently in the R1 district. Two examples, so 37 Rubley Street, which was a small single family home sold in 2019 for 680,000 and then um, was torn down and a single family home was put up and sold the next year for 1.51 million. Um, the seven Hancock Street, which is in my neighborhood, um, sold in 2020 for 639K and then sold um, just a few months ago for 1.5 million. And I think, you know, if we don't enact an article like this, this is pretty much the status quo we're going to get. The um, smaller homes that, you know, are sort of people are latching onto as like, oh, this, you know, allows our town to be affordable are just going to be redeveloped, whether it's into a duplex or a large single family. So I think really our choice is between, do we want to be a town with a decreasing number of starter homes and an increasing number of multi-million dollar single families? Or do we want to be a town that has an increasing number of um, starter home sized um, family units? Um, just one last thing I'd like to note um, is just to point out that uh, you know, there's been talk that this is sort of like a radical push, but I would like to note that um, two families by right is legal in the entire state of California currently. Um, so this is not, you know, an especially radical idea um, at this point in time when we're, we're dealing with a essentially nationwide housing crisis in our urban areas. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Aram Holman. Hello, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Uh -huh. Madam Chair, would it be appropriate for me to ask a question of the ARB at this point? And if so, would that take away from my three minutes? Uh, it would be part of your three minutes, yes. Okay, then, then, okay then, I, then I will wait on that. Uh, okay. my, name, my name is Aram Holman. I live at 12 Whittemore Street. I am a candidate for town meeting for precinct six. I am here to speak against this proposed article. Uh, you've already heard a number of the reasons. I will try to abbreviate what I have to say. Uh, but it seems to me that be it smaller units or larger units, whatever is being proposed for Arlington, whatever the rationales are, it seems to me that the proposed zoning changes are intended more to enhance the profitability of developers than any other goal. That is the one thing which is consistent. Uh, the arguments made in favor of this simply don't hold. And I'm addressing the claims made in the March 3rd memo from Jenny Rate and Kelly Linema and Talia Fox to the ARB. Uh, the claim that this will create more affordable housing, basic linguistic thing, more affordable than what? Just an anecdote, a two family near me, an existing shell was renovated. It was a two family, 800K and 1.3 million for the two units. That was an existing shell. It was not even a tear down. That would have cost even more. Mrs. LaCourt even admits that this is not an affordable housing measure. By definition, measures which increase the total possible supply of market rate, i.e. luxury housing in Arlington make Arlington even less affordable because it raises the price of housing. And also because more importantly, it increases the number of affordable housing units that we need under the supposedly affordable standards of 40B, and those are not affordable to get out from 40B. The claim that Arlington can or should address the quote, racist legacy, end quote, of past zoning is laudable and may even be possible, but further raising the price of housing in Arlington will simply make Arlington's housing even less accessible to those of limited means, regardless of their race or color. In short, I think one could at least argue that this proposed zoning change is another one of the racist policies encoded in zoning that it is supposedly intended 
to, to remedy. It seems like it's just one more. The claim that this will improve environmental sustainability likewise does not hold. Yes, newer construction will be more energy inefficient, but that would be true of any housing built regardless of type. So it is not an argument in favor of this article. The you're, argument you're at that, time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Judith Gerber. Hello, can you all hear me? We can, thank you. Hi, I'm Judith Garber. I'm at uh, Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, I'm also a town meeting member for Precinct 4. Uh, I'm generally uh, in favor of this article. Um, as someone who lives in a multifamily unit, I feel grateful that I get to live in Arlington, and I certainly wouldn't be able to afford a single family home here. Um, and I think increasing our housing is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think we're as dense as we may think we are. And I don't know where everyone lives in Arlington, but here in East Arlington, like it's not so bad. It's really nice having a lot of neighbors. It's, it doesn't feel extremely closed. It doesn't feel extremely dense. Um, obviously this is the kind of neighborhood that I moved into um, knowing what it was. So I understand how everyone's feeling about it, but I just wanted to put that, that word in there. And for some of my other um, town meeting members who I've talked to about this and uh, who couldn't make it to this meeting but feel the same way. Um, we're generally in favor of this, uh, although I, I'm mostly very interested in hearing um, the discussion at town meeting, especially around, you know, there seems to be this question of, is this going to increase teardowns or is it going to, or, or are teardowns destined to happen anyway, and this will just make it uh, able for more people to live in Arlington, which I am in favor of. Um, I don't know if it'll increase teardowns, so I'm, I, I would um, ask if the proponent or the ARB, if they approve this, to see if we can get some kind of information on that. Um, and I also want to say, you know, I've seen some of the information about how many people used to live in Arlington in the past couple decades, and there used to be many more people here. It's not like we're at our maximum capacity. We used to have many more people living here, and I think we can have more people living here again. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, will, I just have an email address, so it's uh, J-A-W-D-B-W. -W. Hi, I'm Janice Weave of Precinct 21. I live on Crescent Hill Avenue, and I'm against this article, and I'm the 17th person on the list to be against it. There were three for it. Um, they did do a knockdown on my street, and the house itself is fine. The driveway is horrible, and the walls do not match up with the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, there are no restrictions on how things are built to keep in line with the um, architecture of the neighborhood. If you go up Orient Avenue, the same thing happened when they built, I think, five or six duplex houses. It looks like a parking lot because no one can park in there garages evidently because there are always two or three houses outside and I hate to see that happen in other areas of town. I think um, as the previous speakers have said, you're trying to push out people who would like to have um, single family homes and you make us feel as though there's something wrong with us. I grew up in a two family home. I enjoyed it. I loved it. But then I moved to a single family home with my parents and then I bought this house in Arlington. And a lot of my friends, most of my friends, have had to move out because of the prices. And only taxes will be increased. Nothing will go down. And you have to understand that when people say, oh, this will be better for the tax rate. It will not be better. And the school will cost us more, as other speakers have said. And Rebecca Peterson was right on target. Nice to see someone who just moved in a few years ago to say she moved here for the very reason that a lot of us moved here, that it's um, suburban and not urban. And the people that are moving in to try to make it urban should go back to the cities that were urban. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be uh, Eileen Cahill. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, hi. Um, uh, yes, Eileen Cahill, Dixon Ave. Um, there's just so much to say. Um, and so many people have made good points of the eight, 17 people that have spoken. Um, I, I just have to approach this from an engineering perspective. It's just irresponsible to human health 
to not look at our infrastructure. With You cannot make this decision without assessing the condition of our below the surface pipes that keep us healthy. This is our water mains. This is our sewer mains. We have the luxury of turning on the water and getting clean drinking water. We have the luxury of flushing the toilet and bringing it away to get treated properly. So from engineering, we literally use the, the zoning to decide how big to size a pipe. And I understand that the justification, there was a meeting last week, was that, okay, population used to be 10,000 more. The pipes are like 60 years old in the ground, okay? We have clay pipes. We have gas mains being dug up. These clay pipes are being broken. We have to look at this. It's like, you just can't make this decision without it. I have a list right here, about 25 trouble spots that the sewer department checks these locations. They're in residential areas, Teresa, Ridge, um, Ridge, Tomahawk, Dodge, Forest. And these are the areas that we're talking about increasing the building and increasing the, um, the, the cars driving on it. I think it's very unrealistic to think that the traffic would not increase. Um, and it's just, I just can't overemphasize, like I just have to really stress this out of the responsibility of being a civil engineer. I'm like environment and the stormwater, I completely agree with that. That, But that's actually, I, I think the answer to that is that this is still contained within the building requirements that I, I think I remember Annie saying that. Um, so I, I, I think we do overbuild because I see clean um, water getting pumped out of people's basements, you know, out of sump pumps and over these huge, huge houses that have been built in the single family. So I, I just, I hope, and I really wish that we could do this in person. Um, it's, it just seems like this is way too big a decision for this town. People that have invested so much money in, in either their, their, their houses and maintaining their houses and being the community that it is. But think, be thankful that when we flush the toilet, it goes away and we don't have to think about it, okay? That's every, something everybody can relate to, right? And we want that for our, our health, okay? We don't want backups into our houses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Colleen Cunningham. All right, actually it's her husband, Stuart. Stuart Rorson, Kensington Park. Um, first of all, I thought, I'll answer a question that was raised a couple of speakers earlier regarding the higher population. Um, Arlington did used to have a higher population. It was largely, you know, large, let's say Irish Catholic families that had five or six kids. So what's happening now is that uh, those large Irish families are gone and they've been replaced by yuppies, like several of the people that have spoken up here. And that leads to, um, you know, the, the problems that people are alluding to, which is higher population density, more people, more services being required, so on and so forth. So we used to, it is true, we used to have more people, but it was just simply large families. So let me go to the main um, point here, which is uh, a number of people have raised these points already, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, it's clear that although this idea was brought forth with some, you know, Annie's trying to solve a problem here, it hasn't been thought through. And I think that many people have uh, expressed the notion that there are a lot of unintended consequences to this, um, this, this article. So unanswered is the question of how we deal with the impact on taxes on the sewer system with the increased population and so on. Unanswered is the question of, you know, how this is going to change the character of the town. Um, and that's a major issue because people love the town because of its character. And if all of a sudden it changes from being what many people appreciate, which is a suburb of single family houses, to something that's a lot more like Somerville or parts of Cambridge, that's going to cause a lot of anger. And, and, and that's not a good thing that we want, you know, we don't want to do that in this, in this town. And I'm afraid that many people, I pay attention to zoning issues, my wife does, most people don't, and they're going to be broadsided by this. So there needs to be, on the subject of, you know, thinking this through and actually preparing for it, one would need to actually alert 
the majority of Arlingtonians that this major change is coming their way. And then the other unanswered question is really, who benefits from this, right? I believe that the proposer thinks that, you know, society as a whole will benefit, but it's very clear that the real beneficiaries are gonna be the real estate industry developers and, you know, the people that make money by doing construction here in Arlington. And the question then is, well, why would we want to, you know, lend more, throw more gasoline on the fire of, you know, developers who are enriching themselves in Arlington at the expense of the existing homeowners who like Arlington the way it is. We don't like the teardowns. Unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of teardowns happening now being replaced with one families. The ARB has not done a good job in stopping that. What will happen under this piece of, under this warrant, is that the teardowns will just all of a sudden turn to making two families everywhere. Thank all you, your time. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Dolores McGee. Hello, hi, I'm Dolores McGee in Precinct 16. And I really appreciate a lot of the comments that some of the um, participants on the call have made. And I agree with one of the previous um, committee me or community members that we should really be doing this in person. So I just want that put out there. Um, so <clears throat> I would just like to say that with greater density in our residential neighborhoods, um, we need to consider um, what the increase in traffic would do to the roads. Um, residential areas throughout the town already experience very unsafe levels of cut through traffic. So um, for instance, our main roads, Mass Ave, Pleasant um, Street, Medford Street, Lake Street, Summer Street, they already cannot handle the traffic we see. So Arlingtonians see the result um, with this increasing amount of drivers speeding through our residential neighborhoods. So um, how will these roads be able to handle even more traffic from our denser neighborhoods if, if these changes were to, to occur? Um, the town is working hard to improve the workability, uh, I mean, the walkability of our town. And, um, you know, it's a big consideration with all the school children that we have walking to and from school each day. This zoning change threatens to undo all of that work um, that we've been, you know, pretty committed to over the years. And um, pushing this, you know, it would just, it would increase the speeding issue that we have too through our neighborhoods. So I think that needs to be considered as well. Um, I think, I'm not sure if, how it would impact like the um, rodent issue, but I do believe we have a pretty significant rodent issue in Arlington too. And I'm wondering if, um, if that would be impacted. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Grant Cook. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Grant Cook, uh, Wallace and Ave. I think I'm still in Precinct 16. Um, so it, it's easy to confuse what is with what ought to be when, when what is is worked out in your favor. Um, somebody mentioned a scalpel versus blunt force. And I, I think zoning large swaths of our towns that only a single family home is allowed seem to be the ultimate in blunt force approach. But we hear talk about expectations of our neighborhood. And I, I live in a, let some, it's led to some pretty nice neighborhoods. I live in one. But if you go back and ask why we did it that way, I suspect some of the reasons would be pretty sensible, and I'm sure some of them would be less savory in their virtue. As somebody has said, we don't have one housing problem, we have many, but they boil down to two areas, scarcity and subsidy. And we see scarcity now in prices on what should be starter homes, well out of reach of middle-income buyers. We talk about luxury units. Even if your home in Arlington is of modest stock, you have a luxury many only dream about, the luxury of wealth and equity. I would love to hear more talk of subsidy of the affordable units. It's what we need to generate true affordability. It's not gonna occur naturally. For those that believe it can, where is it? The land is too expensive and multifamily units must go through regulatory hurdles that we have put in place, discouraging those developments. But as much as we talk about affordable units of a virtual shield professing noble intent, we hear very little doing about it. It has been asked, how do we create these? big A affordable homes organically, and it's usually met with silence from some of the same voices we hear here. 
This proposal is one tool to address scarcity. It's not a panacea. It hopefully is one measure of many. The proposal doesn't change the size of the home. It adds people. I have the good fortune to live across from an R2 district. So I have duplexes and apartments across the street. Those people contribute greatly to my neighborhood. They're my friends. They're my peers. In my prior years, I lived in a neighborhood in East Arlington that had many single family homes mixed in. And the neighborhood was very vibrant. So commentary about negative impact of expectations of a neighborhood. I'd like to see more specifics on that. We surely don't discourage single family unit construction in R2 districts. And we have plenty of two families in R1s today that existed prior to zoning. I don't buy many of the data free allegations of infrastructure breakdown. As was recently pointed out on the same discussion, our largest sewage generator was the Brigham factory, which as we all know is gone. Our schools have capacity. I watched the high school get built. I know it can handle more students because we planned for that. And some of this also betrays the commitment we talk about a lot with discussion of things like Black Lives Matter, with the signs we have in our front yard. Wealth seeks an outlet. And our towns and many of our neighboring towns, support of scarcity, exclusionary zoning, drives the gentrification we criticize into other neighborhoods. It drives it into Roxbury. It drives it into Southie. It drives it into East Somerville. But those places are far away. We don't see them day to day. Living next to an R2 district, I've seen demolitions. Paul Revere has had several. Four in close proximity were replaced with two families and some by single families. All of them are more expensive. I'm sorry, you're, you're at time. Okay, thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Barbara Thornton. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there's a, there's a lot to respond to here, so I'm going to go uh, through some points as Bar quickly as... Barbara, I'm sorry, could you please just get your Oh, I'm your sorry, Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16, uh, Park uh, 223 Park Ave. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, this is becoming a town full of McMansions. And I keep hearing people complain about McMansions, and when we finally have a, a, an opportunity like this warrant article that Ms. LaCourt pro is proposing to slow down the McMansions, we seem to be opposed to it. I moved to Arlington because I, I valued the economic diversity that was in this town. And, and it was in this town and it isn't anymore. Um, I'm not asking for a great deal of economic diversity. This isn't about affordable housing but it is about creating a diversity of housing styles and types for our different phases of life that would, be, that would be good for people. It's not going to change developers coming in and tearing down and rebuilding housing, but it will keep them from, it, they have a choice. They can build McMansions or they can build something else. This will give them something else to build. And I'll bet you that given their choice, they would just as soon build a two family as one more McMansion. Uh, I wanna go back to Eileen Cahill's uh, comments about infrastructure. And I think infrastructure is important to consider. More than half of the, of the homes in Arlington, I would guess are over 50 years old. The infrastructure within those homes not the pipes, because I trust our DPW to keep, to keep good care of the pipes and upgrade. But within the homes, they're not being upgraded regularly, which is why so many are subject to tear down once they're bought. Uh, you can have a small home, but it's going to be incredibly expensive to, to renovate it, to bring it up to standard. And now some of the standards of these older homes are becoming seriously dangerous. So we either need to figure out how to renovate these older homes or, or provide new homes of the same size that are available to people in Arlington that are safe. And I, and I hope that this, the ARB will consider doing that, consider the importance of standing up to McMansions, providing a diversity of housing styles, and providing for opportunities to renovate the infrastructure of the homes in Arlington by allowing this process. And lastly, it won't happen overnight. This is an incremental approach. It's going to be uh, of the 19,000 homes in Arlington, 
I don't know how many it'll be a year, but it's a very small percentage, maybe 10 homes across the town a year uh, that this happens to. And I think that's something that we can find out about for, by before town meeting and make some good guesses on it. But uh, I, I very much am in support of this article. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, the next speaker will be Sanjay Newton. Hi, Sanjay Newton. I'm a precinct, precinct 10 town meeting member on Ottawa Road. Um, and I will uh, keep my comments short this evening. Uh, I'll thank the board for spending so much time listening to so much comment this evening. And I'll just say um, thank you uh, to Ms. LaCourt for bringing forward this article and uh, express my support for it. And I'll, I'll leave it right there. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Susan Stamps. Okay. Uh, yeah, here Great. I am. Oh, perfect timing. I just got back home, coming back from New York on the train. Um, it's been a great discussion tonight. Thank you to the ARB. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, would you please, sorry, would you please introduce yourself first, last name and address? I'm, I'm so sorry. Yes. I'm, That's okay. Uh, Thank Susan, you. Susan Stamps. I live in East Arlington on Grafton Street. Um, I'm also a member, a town meeting member and I am a member of the tree committee, although I'm not speaking for the tree committee. Um, I have a tremendous uh, respect for Annie LaCourt and um, their people are desperate to try to figure out how to make more housing available. I, I completely agree with the, um, you know, what, what, um, what the push is. I, I really can't agree with a proposal, though, for all the reasons that has been stated tonight. My particular, um, I used to live in Carlisle, where they have two and four acre zoning because they're on wells and um, their own septic. And when in my time there, they were cutting down huge acres of trees and putting in McMansions. And I, I was on the housing authority at the time, and I was pushing for them to in those McMansions rather than making them single family homes to put two or four units in those buildings which they wouldn't do because of zoning but the reason there was not particularly to provide more housing at a reasonable cost because I didn't think it would but it was to prevent the degradation of the environment um, unfortunately I, um, which, it, which it would have done, it would have been a good thing for the environment in Carlisle. I think it would, would have, I think I agree with the speakers tonight that it would have the opposite effect in Arlington because right now so many of the single family homes have nice yards and big trees and, and um, all kinds of greenery. And um, I think there, everybody understands that if a, a builder tears down a house and puts in uh, a duplex versus a single family home, they're gonna make a lot more money. And um, which that's, they're entitled to do that. And uh, it's a noble profession. But what, what's gonna happen is they're going to build out to the lot lines, all the trees are gonna come down. The driveways are gonna be bigger because they have uh, two, you know, two houses to put in driveways for. So as one of the speakers, there's gonna be more impervious services, which is really the wrong way to go in this time of climate change. Taking out the trees is the wrong way to go. And um, there have to be some better solutions out there. Um, I think we ought to be looking to CPA money to um, effectuate more um, subsidized affordable housing and, and think of some other creative ideas, but I don't think this is the right one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, identified as R as iPad. Uh, thank you, Stephen Blagden, Hutchinson Road. I sent uh, the board a letter on this and won't repeat myself. There have been many good comments against Article 38, which I agree with. Uh, this article won't reduce McMansions. It will increase teardowns and just as large or larger than McMansions, two families will be built. I keep hearing a change is not a worry because it'll be incremental and take a long time. 
This is like increasing the water temperature slowly on the frog so it doesn't realize it's being boiled. <laughs> Listening to the presentation, I was surprised and disappointed that this hasn't been thought through and the effects identified and considered. It seems to have aspirational goals rather than realistic ones. The ADU bylaw ended single family zoning last year. The town should see how that lower scale change works out and analyze the impacts before something like this, which were turbocharged teardowns. How can you get four units replacing a single family? You build a duplex to the maximum structural limits with rough ADU plumbing and electrical in the garages. You get your completion approval. Now the builder converts the garages to ADUs and doesn't have to replace the parking. That has bad effects. I've noticed in R0, the teardown threshold looks to have reached about a million dollars. I made some practical points in my letter. A few of the written comments make a good point that this patrol, the proposal is a betrayal of the implied compact with those who spent a lot of money to buy and live in a single family house. Article 38 would destroy Arlington as we know it. Please say no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Alex Bagnell. Hello, um, Alex Bagnell, Wyman Street. Uh, zoning rules and land use policy are complex mechanisms with a lot of levers. In the end, they are an expression of our community values. With zip code playing an extremely large role in determining economic opportunities and household incomes, we should be welcoming to more people in our high opportunity community, not continuing to exclude. Exclusion by race and or class were key drivers in the creation of single family zoning. We can and should do better. This article isn't going to solve our housing problems and nothing is gonna happen overnight, but it's a meaningful step in the right direction and I am very much in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I believe we have heard from uh, all of the speakers this evening who have their hand up uh, to speak about Article 38. Yes, Jenny. I didn't get a chance to speak. Uh, I, I, okay, I'm sorry, you didn't have your hand up. So um, could you please, I, you're more than welcome to, to speak if you haven't had a chance this evening. You can introduce yourself with your first, last name, and uh, address. That would be great. Hi, thank you. Sorry, it looked like I had a hand up on my side, so that's, that's okay. Please, please go ahead. Yep. Uh, Terry Kirkland, Brunswick Road. Um, so a few things that we listened to, um, you know, for Mr. Weinstein, uh, Mr. Wagner, uh, Miss Evans, we fully agree with all of your um, statements put forth. I really wish we had more time to listen to Mrs. Warden. Uh, personally, a lot of the things she's saying about how people are taking small houses and building it up uh, to these McMansions, why aren't we imposing more rules like that? Mrs. Warden's thoughts were very well thought out. I wish she had more time to continue what she was saying, because uh, that's where it is. She said no one was coming and, and speaking to these problems on you know, taking a smaller home, you know, maybe 800 square feet or less, and let's keep it to those sizes and let's help people uh, get those smaller homes that we're talking about. Um, also to uh, what Ms. Cahill said, about infrastructure, we learned about that firsthand. Um, you know, when the house came up next to us, the uh, the water line, which was just the drain off water, was not inspected properly by the town. And what happened? A full crack happened, and tons of water, thousands and thousands of gallons of water, went under our property. That's a huge issue. Um, when we're talking about all these houses coming down and what's going to happen to the green space uh, the across the you know across the street, we also had three houses go up, and over those 40, 50 trees that were there, every single one was cut down. Every time I've seen a multifamily home that's maybe as they said tear down and built up, any trees on that property are gone, so the contractor can get the maximum space. They don't care about the greenery. I see a lot of two-family houses that don't even have a yard uh, in many homes. I've walked around them and most of the ones that were two families and they made sure they condoized them and selling them again, maximize the lot. They had they had maybe a foot before their fence. So those are just some of the things that 
you know, we're very concerned of, um, you know, coming, we're in an R1 district right now. I couldn't imagine in a ranch style home that we have a large frontage that you could put up a huge double decker. I think that it, it would not even look well with our, you know, the, the rest of the, the, the houses around us. Um, so we really hope that more people decide that this is not the way to go. Um, this feels that it was just a prematurely put together. What we're not talking about is other people have stated, what's the parking gonna happen? What do our schools are gonna look like? You know, we have put all this money into these schools, but they're, they're gonna be maxed out if we take, what is it, the 79% uh, that's R1 or R0, and we can make them into two families. That's a lot more people. That's a lot more trash that has to be picked up. So I think there's a lot of problems and this was this is just not a well thought out um, or well prepared argument for us all to do and especially by zoom so this is something we really need the whole town to get into and everybody should have a notice to see only like 80 people on this meeting is is sad but thank you for your time and thanks for letting me speak. <laughs> thank you um, and then the last speaker this evening will be uh, Gary Goldsmith. Oh, you're, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself, then we can hear you. There, there we go. go. There we go. Gary Goldsmith, Beverly Road. Um, quick, uh, two quick points or two quick questions. One is, it is disingenuous to think that there would be fewer cars. I think we can assume that anybody who is purchasing a, a house or a unit in Arlington is going to have at least one car. Um, so my one question then is, if we were to uh, uh, to uh, enact this uh, this article, uh, would we require two uh, two parking spots? I believe someone earlier said that uh, the current requirement is one spot for each dwelling unit. Uh, we would now have to require two parking spots, um, and how would ADUs affect that? Um, the other question I have is that uh, I think it's disingenuous to think that this would. Uh, have any issue, uh, have any impact on reducing the McMansionization uh, of uh, Arlington houses. Um, I think it's pretty fair to assume that if uh, a builder uh, developer is uh, building two units uh, rather than one, um, they will try to maximize uh, the, the size and uh, the, of the units. Um, which will maximize the price. Uh, and one final comment, and that is that there is a certain um, uh, population looking for a house which is costing two or 2.2 million. Uh, there is a much larger population looking for a house of 1.1 uh, million, even though that seems like a crazy number, but that's, that's what it is. Um, so this is likely to increase our population. Some of the estimates on growth are, uh, include single family uh, houses being uh, expanded, but um, it is a lot more likely to sell uh, units at 1.1 million than 2.2. Um, those are my questions or comments. Thank you very much. Uh, and I thank the board for considering this. Thank you. All right, so um, at this point, I will uh, turn things back to the board and to uh, Annie LaCourt, the petitioner. I'm just going to recap a couple of the topics, um, Annie, that, that I heard, some of which you may um, want to address this evening and some you may want to um, think about and, and come back at a, at a future evening and, and respond to or respond in writing, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to run through a couple that, that I highlighted and then asked any of the board members that there, there are others um, as well. So um, there was a question about, um, and maybe this is something that you and um, Jenny have discussed, but how you are seeing the residential design guidelines potentially um, playing into the requirements for um, the two family dwelling units um, that, that would be proposed on um, in the R1 and R0 um, districts. Um, the question about will this increase teardowns or simply be um, a reconfiguration of existing is a topic that people are looking to have addressed. Uh, the question about traffic impact um, and parking, I believe that Ken also had some questions about your thoughts on, on parking. Um, and I believe that that also played into 
um, some of the questions that um, Kristen um, and others had about um, infrastructure and um, pervious, um, pervious uh, potential increases in pervious surfaces, mm -hmm. um, specifically related to stormwater runoff. Um, there was a question about any potential projections on impact on property taxes. Um, and then we go back to Jean's question about any, you know, any of your thoughts potentially on limiting the size of the units in these particular R0 and R1 districts if they choose to, to move to a, a two family. Um, construction. So um, I'm not sure if you're prepared or would like to answer oh, any of those. I'm I'm prepared to give some general answers now, but I will That's fantastic. turn those Great. questions if someone can give them to me in writing into an FAQ going forward. Yes, so, I can we can certainly follow up with um, with that list. Sure. So let me um, give you all an anecdote about the inspiration for this article. So when I first moved into my house, which for Don Seltzer's sake, you should know is directly across from the Stratton School. So it's right in the Stratton School neighborhood. There was a row of eight or 10 um, ranch houses on the other side of the Stratton School playground on Mountain Ave. All of them six room houses. Some of them had sort of kicked out the back, maybe added a little wing or a deck or whatever. All of them on 6,000 square foot lots. Every one of those houses, when it has sold over the last 15 years or so, has been torn down and rebuilt as a larger home. The last one of those houses that was torn down and rebuilt as a larger home was built as to the maximum size of home that you could possibly put on that lot with the maximum driveway and a two-car garage. So that house has the exact impact that a two family allowed by this article on that same lot would have. There are three or four of those single family ranch houses left. As they sell, they will all turn into exactly that house because that's what's being built in my neighborhood right now. The largest single family possible. So what we have is a 5,000 square foot house with as much driveway as is allowable under our bylaw and a two-car garage across the street from Scranton School and a single family home worth $2 million, which could have been two very generous duplex units with no more effect on the environment or the lot with no more paving and no more structure than is already there. So what I'm seeing in my neighborhood is that every tear down is, is exactly this. Every time someone tears a house down, it turns into this very large single family home. And what I'm saying is those could have been two families. Now, in terms of trees and permeability, I don't think they're going to have a different effect if there's two families or there's one, because the restrictions that we're placing on the building of the structure itself are the same. Same setbacks, same height restriction, same volume. So we're not increasing the environmental impact. It is true that there will be more people and more kids in the schools and there will be more, um, you know, presumably more water flowing through our sewers. I've discussed this and several other people have discussed it with people in the town, the town manager, Mike Rademacher, so on and so forth. They don't see a concern. These are the people who are in charge of managing our water and sewer. And they believe that our population is much lower than it was at its peak. Everybody is using more water conserving equipment and appliances, so on and so forth. And so our flow is not increasing, even as our the number of housing units in town increase because the population is not matching what it used to be. And we also have a very good, very consistent, anybody on town meeting knows this, consistent program of replacing our sewers and improving them so that we have less infiltration and inflow. So 
the, the folks who can affect it are aware of the infrastructure problems and they are working on them. And they're working on them regardless of whether or not we increase the number of housing units in town. So my general answer is I did think about this. I thought about it a lot. I spent the whole summer watching that house go up and thinking about it. And all I'm saying is I'd like more neighbors. And I would like not to see these small ranches get knocked down and turned into McMansions, but I don't think there's any way for us to reasonably prevent someone from selling their house, maximizing their investment in the property that is probably the sole asset that they have and selling it to whoever is the highest bidder, which in many cases is a developer. If it's not a developer, and someone moves in and does not want to expand that house or does not want to build a two family, that's great. This bylaw does not require them to do so. So I think we're talking about, you know, at, at the most 10, 20, uh, you know, teardowns like this happening in a year, maybe less because on average we're only having 27. So it's not going to be this huge overnight change. And in fact, it may not happen at all because this doesn't require any particular developer or any particular homeowner to build a two family. It just says you have the flexibility to do it. If that's what the market demands, that's what you wanna build, that's what you think is best for your own um, investment in your property. Right. Were there other Thank questions you. I didn't address in that? No, I think, I think there were, I think you um, got to most of them. And again, we can follow up with, um, with a list. Um, I'll, at this point, what I'd like to do is run through um, my fellow board members and see following public comment, if there are any other questions um, you would like to specifically ask um, any the court to um, follow up on or um, address prior to when we uh, deliberate on this on uh, April 4th, um, note that we are, we're not going to have a deliberation this evening. This is just for any additional questions or guidance that you'd like to provide at this time. So we'll start with Ken. Hi, Andy, thank you for uh, that comment. Um, I do have one question that if you don't mind uh, doing a little research on and getting back to us on. And uh, that one is um, where this has been enacted in other states or in other areas, what has what has the outcome been, or you know what are, what are, or what have they found, uh, pluses or minuses? You know, um, you know I heard talk that all of California has eliminated that. I also heard rumors that um, Washington or or in the Seattle area is also the same way. Uh, are there other areas that have done this, and what was the outcome, and how long has it been? It just to be another uh, more information for us to uh, talk about and be, uh, and so we're not making haste judgments here. That's all I had, uh, Rachel. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean. Yes, thanks. Just a couple quick things. I really appreciated Annie's um, response that uh, she just gave. I just want to, I think, add on to that a little bit because a lot of. Um, people tonight said, you know, we have to do something about stopping these huge single family homes from getting built. And the problem is that the state law does not allow us to impose any sort of limit on the size of a single family home that would get built. That's pretty clear in the state zoning code. However, it only applies to single family homes. So we could, and this is why I raised it uh, earlier, we could impose size limits on the duplexes and the two families, which would, I think, have the effect of at least having somewhat less expensive homes than they other, otherwise would have, and somewhat smaller footprints than they otherwise um, would have. So um, yeah, I don't have any particular questions. I just wanted to, you know, piggyback on what Ms. LaCourt just said. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, Melissa. Um, Madam Chair, we're only asking questions of the proponent at this point. 
Correct. Okay. Or, um, or, or the department, if you have any questions for Jenny or um, Kelly. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe this is for the proponent just going forward, I think to echo what Rachel, you said at the beginning of the conversation to really consider how um, outreach happens because you can probably tell from these conversations, there's a lot of information and people pick up, up from different areas. So how can you better you know, kind of communicate the essential pieces of it and get people familiar with it? Um, and I think the other thing that I, I guess I heard, and even from my own, you know, kind of experience sharing this with other people, um, also being able to explain well enough for people, the ADU and, you know, to family and how that kind of, you know, the differences and the benefits or, you know, comments. So those are a couple of things I've heard from other people as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have one comment and that and two questions. Um, one for the proponent and one for staff. Uh, one is I I do want to uh, express some gratitude for to Ms. Lacord. Every it seems like every year we have discussions where people are concerned about housing affordability and you know the escalator that's been going up and up and up and up for the last twenty years. Um, and somehow we never can seem to agree on what. Um, you know, what to do about this, but it does take, I, I think a lot of, uh, it takes a certain amount of courage to propose something like this because it's, you know, it's, it's something different and it's going to be controversial. Having said that, uh, to my two questions, uh, one, well, the first is more of a suggestion, I think, for the proponent, uh, given, I, I, I think I fall into the same category as Mr. Lau, where it would be interesting to have some data on where similar changes have been enacted. Um, I know that uh, Washington State, um, you know, allows multifamily by right in cities over a certain size. California has been mentioned. Uh, Minneapolis was, I think, the first large city in the United States to allow multifamily by right. And that's been a few years ago. So there may be, you know, there's probably a good chance that there is some data to go on. Now, my question for staff is, um, how, have there been any ADUs permitted yet? You know, since we passed the bylaw, you know, last town meeting. Okay. No, there have not been any ADUs permitted. There have been no applications for accessory dwelling units um, and nothing permitted either. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Annie, I, I think I would just, again, as I had mentioned earlier, I'd, I'd echo um, Melissa's question. I think it'll be important to address um, outreach. Outreach for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think there, there are a couple of really good comments to, to, to take a look at here. Um, we can certainly follow up with, again, the list of, of questions that we provided with you. And if they're um, in taking a look at those, if, if there is some additional information you'd like to send to the board prior to the fourth, we'd certainly be more than happy to receive that. Um, otherwise, we will discuss at that time. Great. Thank you, Rachel. I just want to mention one other thing for um, sure. uh, public consumption for the future. My, I'm not Mrs. I'm Ms. My husband's got a different last name, and um, I would appreciate the public taking note of that in future. Great. Thank uh, you for the clarification. You're welcome. Great. All right. Thank you again for all the work you put in and for joining us this evening, I appreciate it. All right, uh, so with that, we will now move to Article 28, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for enhanced business districts. Um, and at this time, I will turn it over to uh, Jenny Raitt uh, to discuss the uh, memo that was provided by the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Thank you, Rachel. I am going to share my screen and give a quick presentation and then I'll turn it back to the board with any questions or comments. Great, Sunday. thank you. Okay. 
can see that? Yes. Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk about the zoning bylaw amendment that addresses enhanced business districts. Um, I'm going to give this sort of overview and then I'll get into the details of the actual amendment. So this is applicable to only properties that are within the business zoning districts. Can you hear me okay? I can, there was a little feedback. I think that there might be one or two people with their microphones um, unmuted. If you, unless you're Jenny, if you could please mute your microphone, that would be great. I think I might've taken care of it, okay. Um, all right, only properties within the business zoning districts, proposals for new development or redevelopment, of course, those are things that come before this board. Um, and uh, this would not be applicable to any existing commercial spaces with frontage that already would exceed the dimensional requirements. Those would be exempt. So we looked into this a little bit more broadly. Um, Kelly did some research at, uh, as to other communities, both in the inner core in metropolitan Boston, and then also um, other communities throughout the country and found that um, it is what we're talking about doing is compliant with recommendations and standards that come from a group called the Congress for New Urbanism, which is essentially, uh, they create standards and recommendations and designs um, around smart growth. Um, and so one of the things around smart growth is good design. Um, and so that's one, one of the places that we looked uh, for some precedent. Uh, we also noted that this bylaw amendment would expand upon the requirements that were described in the site standard section as adopted last year by this board um, and town meeting um, through the industrial zoning uses. Um, those amendments specifically gave a sort of a suite of standards that would apply to any new development or reconstruction in those districts. Um, so the proposed amendment is really aiming to encourage pedestrian activity and maintain a more active streetscape while also limiting the amount of ground floor spaces that are occupied by banks or offices or lobbies, essentially non-active uses. So the proposed amendment itself um, is in uh, development standards. It applies to new construction, additions over 50% of the existing footprint or debris development, and it would be required to, um, I'm gonna actually scroll through. Um, to provide a minimum transparency on the ground floor, um, to make all facades visible, to ensure that each ground floor uh, storefront in a building has a clearly defined primary entrance, um, to ensure that any lobby entrances for upper story uses are optimally located and well-defined. Um, the primary building entry is connected by an accessible surface to the public right of way or the sidewalk. Lobbies are limited in both width and total area to preserve ultimate, ultimately preserve uh, floor space for other uses. And as I noted, existing commercial spaces with frontage that exceeds these requirements would be exempt. And that's, I'm actually gonna pause there and see if the board has any questions that pretty much walk through the bylaw amendment. Great, thank so, you, Rachel, Jenny. You're welcome. Great. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. Any questions uh, for Jenny? No, I'm generally supportive of this. Great, thank you. Jean? Yes, I'm generally supportive too. I have a number of questions. Um, some of them are just wording changes. I don't know if you want me to go through them now, Jenny, or if you'd just like me to send you I... the wording changes afterwards. Um, and I'll leave that up to Rachel, but I will note that uh, it's probably obvious from hopefully the memo. We did make some wording changes based upon feedback that came from the zoning bylaw working group and they are highlighted. Hopefully that was clear when it came through uh, in the Novus agenda. But um, are there other things beyond those edits? Okay, so sure, Rachel, Jean, what would you like sure, to do? Sure, Jean, I would say if it's um, small, adjustments that you could send those to Jenny, but if there's anything that's substantive, that it would probably be helpful for the board to, to, to hear those changes. Yeah, let me just mention the ones that I think are the most substantive. Great, under, thank you. Under the standards, um, the second bullet, which starts all facades visible from a public 
right of way. The second sentence says, no blank facades are permitted. And is that no blank facades on any side of the building or only no blank facade that faces a public way? I think it's that faces a public way. So we need to, okay, yeah. so we need to modify that a little bit. In the, um, in the next bullet talks about a primary entrance that faces the principal street. So I'm thinking of a building that's on the corner and it has storefronts on two sides. So there may be a principal street, there may be two principal streets. So I think we need to slightly change that so that um, it's clear that if there are storefronts, I'm thinking, for example, the building at the corner of um, um, Mass Ave and Lake Street, where there are some businesses face Lake, some businesses face Mass Ave, if we consider Mass Ave, the principal street, we have a problem with this piece. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I think are. Oh, so I'll save the, the others are wording changes that I'll send you. I don't think they're um, particularly problematic. But the one that the zoning bylaw working group mentioned is if you look at the purpose, one of the purposes is to eliminate the amount of ground floor space occupied by banks, offices, lobbies, non-active. Well, this does a good job, I think, with the lobbies, but it doesn't, I don't really see how this limits the amount of floor space occupied by banks and offices, which is one of the observations made by another member of the zoning bylaw working group, not me, but I think there's a little bit of a mismatch. So we either take out some of those, change the purpose a little bit, or add something about banks and offices. That's really helpful, Jean. Um, I, I have one question, Rachel, and then yes. one suggestion. I'll start with the suggestion, actually. Um, the last point that was made. But I, 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 I agree with that point, actually. And I don't think that this changes the the use per se, but maybe it should just say non-active uses, you know, and then that just covers it because it's not, it's not banks or offices, lobbies even. I mean, we, we make the points about lobbies and the standards, but I put that back to the board potentially if you're, depending upon where this goes, um, that it could just state non-active uses. How I, would agree you, with, I would agree with Jenny. Um, I, I don't like the word bank and offices put in there. Jenny, okay. how, would lobby. You, how would you define non-active uses for purposes of this? <laughs> I guess that's a good point. Um, short of saying, I think we use, you know, limited, um, well, I need to think about it and I don't wanna yeah. take the time right. here right. to do that. Let me, let me think about that. The question that I had though is, um, I think it's actually an important one that you raised about Mass Ave and Lake, also um, 117 Broadway. Also, there are a number of cases actually where we've 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 approved buildings on corner lots. There's actually like <laughs> numerous right ones. Yeah, so I think how we deal with corner lots is a really good question. I might just put that back to the board about how you want to deal with that. Probably deserves its own bullet point under the standards as a sort of standalone issue. Um, so maybe, I mean, you know, again, to think about a little bit more, I think those are really good points. Yeah, maybe. there are buildings throughout town. I just used the one in the corner of Mass and Lake as an yeah. example, but, you know, Park Ave and Mass Ave has that, you know, and, you know, if I thought some more, I'd think of some others also. Yeah, yeah, multiple, multiple uh, buildings that have been approved are on corner lots, so. Yeah, so, okay, those, those are okay. my comments. And Jenny, I'll send you the what I think are only minor wording changes. And if they're not, I apologize in advance for that. Okay. Thank you, Jean. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, we could, Jenny, did you want us to follow up on the question regarding the ground uh, storefronts and the question about the principal street now? Or do you want us to follow up on that? Uh, I separately. I think we could go through the rest of the board comments okay. and then, and then we'll see what up. else is outstanding yep. and figure out what to do 
and let the public, I think there's only at the moment, there's one hand raised, just so you okay, know. Okay, great. We'll circle back to that one um, after public comment then. So Melissa, any uh, questions for uh, Jenny? Hi, Jenny. Um, thanks for putting this together. So just I'm curious on how it's only for the applied to new construction additions, existing footprints. So I guess where I'm coming from is when there's a change of use, for example, how is that handled? It wouldn't apply? Wouldn't apply unless they're doing something significant with reconstruction, it would not apply. And remind me what the significant threshold is. I think it's 50% is oh, what it says in here. Okay. Yeah. And that, and remind, again, sorry, I feel like part of um, what I'm thinking is that some of this is under new construction. I understand that when there's a significant investment, but when there's the smaller changes that, you know, we have talked about here, I know, it, you know, one of the ARBs on the bank uses, that one concerns me and that's a change of use. So this wouldn't apply. Could it apply or should it, you know, I guess throwing it back to the board, should it be applicable in that sense? Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time, Melissa? Well, I guess I'm trying to figure out if it should include um, when applicability for a change of use. Okay, let's come back to that one um, when we also talk about corner lots, since that's a question for the board, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Steve, any questions for Jenny? Uh, no, there's... One follow-up remark about um, non non-active uses. Um, you know, it it does feel. You know, it does it. I, I would struggle with how to personally struggle with how to define that. So I'm, you know, I I, I can sympathize there. The only place I know of that has, that I'm aware of that has something like this is uh, Cambridge's Central Square Business District where they regulate banks and it's basically on a certain percentage, no more than a certain percentage of a block face can be composed of banks or financial institutions. Uh, at least that's if my memory serves me correctly. Um, I don't know if we wanted to you know, consider possibly going down that route, but it is, you know, it, 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 is, a, it, is, it is one idea to, we could consider. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, and Jenny, I'll just follow up. I know that we're going to talk a little bit about non-active uses and lobbies. Um, the term lobbies is a potentially a bit of a challenge when you think about hotel lobbies, which can be active uses, and um, you know, obviously, is something that we've recently permitted. Which um, I don't know if the right move is to uh, minimize the size of those. So when we get back to that, that's just something that I'll from there as well. Any other questions um, for, for Jenny um, before we move to public comment? All right, uh, so any member of the public wishing to speak on, um, on this warrant article, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. This is again, article number 28. Um, I will call on you in the order that hands are raised, and we will start with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, just one quick question. Um, what is the intent and purpose of speaking to the entrance for the upper floors to be optimally located? I don't understand that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, why don't we go ahead and um, answer that one? I think that that is a is a good point of clarification other people may have questions about. Um, Jenny, do you want to speak to that one? I'm happy to, but if, if you no, want to. Go I'll, ahead. Be happy. I'll let you speak to it and I'll add. Sure. So um, I think with, with that particular citation, um, it's really, um, looking to identify for, um, you know, for example, for a mixed use property, 
where you have the residential entry and the lobby um, as opposed to the um, any entrances for for storefronts um, you know ensuring that you are optimizing that location and um, uh, ensuring that the the storefronts have um, are provided to the public in a way that is um, highly visible and that the the lobbies are um, are not uh, kind of bifurcating the the different the different uh, storefront uh, sections in terms of the facade. But Jenny, go ahead and um, I'm sure you have additional color that you'd like to add there. I actually I I liked the way that you you phrased all of that. Um, you know I think uh, that that's kind of the key. We we don't want to see basically dead space on storefronts. You know, when we walk down Mass Ave or Broadway, we want to have, yeah, you know, we want to have something that makes us want to visit that store, something that pulls us in. If it's something that is just sort of, you know, blank space or just a window that sort of doesn't have any engagement, anything, you know, product or anything that's sort of bringing, luring you inside, that's sort of the, that's that inactive sort of use of the space and something that's sort of not well optimized, which is I think the word that you used. Um, so this is sort of aiming to, and in a, in a small way, um, try to limit the amount of that kind of space in our storefronts. The other thing is our storefronts are very small. There's not, <laughs> there's not that much room. You know, when you, if you walk down Mass Ave, you'll see the storefronts are not that wide. There's not that much space to optimize. So why would we not them want them to be fully optimized? So this is basically trying to get at that. Of course, in a larger scale redevelopment, you'd want to you'd want to see even more of that. And so some of the points that we've made about the mixed use developments that have been approved, um, the hotel. I mean, there's a lot of different examples where the board has tried their best through design um, to encourage those, you know, that sort of activity and engagement at the street level. But there's only so much that we can do. So this this is an attempt to try to get at um, more of that in the actual criteria and in the requirements. I hope that helps to answer some of your question, Steve. Uh, so, uh, Madam Chair, I think then it does. Thank you both. That that helps me out quite a bit. I think um, you might want to consider more words than just optimized because you don't know what is being optimized. And I think what you're telling me here, if I understand you correctly, is you're optimizing the street busyness and presentation of the storefront as interesting and welcoming. Just, I'm not saying use all those words, but optimizing, if you just say optimize, you know what you're optimizing for. And for a moment, I thought perhaps you met um, uh, folks with uh, other abilities and things like that. I was unclear. So, so thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Jean and, and Ken, do you mind if I take James Fleming's comment? Um, uh, unless you have something specific to to that one, Jean, I, I see you nodding your head. Did you want to oh, go ahead then? Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to also say to Steve, we have had some buildings come before us in the past few years when the entire front was storefront, but there were second and third um, levels. So they would sort of have to be on the side or the back for offices or for apartments. So if we didn't, so we have to allow for that because it both helps the streetscape and it allows the second and third floors to be accessed. Great, thank you, Gene. That's a, that's a really good point. Ken, thank did you, you have something else to add? Just something real quick. Uh, the way we look at things is there's two programs, one that supports the, the mixed use above and then uh, what's the, the program below. And, we're, and we wanna put the primary uh, program below, which is activate the, uh, the street edge uh, is the primary. That's how I, how I see these things. And that's how we usually, how I usually look at it. When we, when we look at a project, we want to keep that um, program on the first floor that activates the street life, uh, engages the street edge, uh, the primary. Great, thank you. Uh, Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, next, we'll have James Fleming. Is that working now? It is, yep. 
Fantastic. James Sloan, 58 Oxford Street. I have a question about active uses. At the end of my street, there's a floral shop called Derby Farms. They close at 5 p.m. They that, sound, that doesn't seem like an active use, and yet it's something that I can't imagine anyone here would say we don't want in our town. And I can think of other stores like Henry's Bear Park, the Bait and Tackle Shop in my neighborhood, all these other places that they don't draw street traffic, and yet we like them. They're useful. We, we, we serve it. We go to them for something that we need. So my question is, why, why call out banks and offices specifically? Because the only thing I can see that this, to Jenny's comment about you want to make sure that the storefront has stuff in it, if you're tr trying to control that, it sounds like trying to tell a business how to run their operation, which feels like it's something that we definitely should not be doing. So I, I guess why, why the focus on banks and offices and not other things that don't draw crowds and you activate the streetscape because you could say, and yet we still like those things. Great question. Thank you very much. Uh, Jenny, did you want to specifically respond to that one? Just, just to say that I think a retail and a restaurant use, both of those uses are completely different and draw you in and are much more engaging than an office or um, in this particular case, what it says here, a bank. Um, a bank, you know, they draw you in in different ways, perhaps, and I think that they create a different type of use and, it, and a different environment on the street compared to when you're looking at a store and you've given the one example, which has, you know, very decorative windows, um, there's a lot of interest, there's something that's drawing you in. Um, that's, that's a different, I think that's a very different use category of a retail store, whether they're selling something specifically in the storefront or not, there's something that's more engaging. Same thing for restaurants, you're seeing people usually in a window, eating, doing something that, you know, again, would ideally bring you in to go to the restaurant. This is trying to say, let's, let's make more space for that and less space on our streetscapes that is sort of limiting or creating sort of a, a sort of a, a wall between pedestrians and what's behind that wall. Whether it's intriguing or not is, is no, sort of, this is not about, you know, you have to have product in the window. No, it's that, about, that, that, that makes sense. But it's just like the flower shop closes at 5 p.m. So by any stretch of the imagination, that is a dead space after 5 p.m. Same with the, the gift shop, which closes at 6 p.m. And Bear Park, I think, closes at 6.30. Those are those are dead spaces in the, in the evenings. And some of them aren't even open on Sundays. It doesn't seem, quite frankly, it doesn't seem fair <laughs> Just to say we're going to so, focus on these categories, yeah, when, so, when, when, when depending on the hours, a business can be a dead space, even though they are a different kind of use. So James, one of the one of the things that we look at when we um, are reviewing applications and and looking at you know the businesses in the street in general, or this this idea of different day parts. So activation at different time of, of the day. So you could say the same thing about a restaurant, which doesn't open until 5 p.m. So I think that, you know, irrespective of the actual hours of business, knowing that there is a significant portion of the day where there is an active activation, whether it is from eight until five or five until midnight, you know, the fact that there is um, a contribution through an active um, presence on the street is is what's important as opposed to the specific operating hours. And banks don't do that under any operating hours. They don't have employees that go in and out that go out for lunch and patronize local restaurants. Well, that's that's the question that I think the board has been debating and will be part of the discussion going uh, forward. I, I get it. My comment is basically, I think you basically should just not do any of that. Just let them, let them be, let the restaurants Understood. Banks be what they be. And thank you. Okay. Um, any any other uh, any other questions or, or comments? Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will uh, run through the um, list of board members again um, to see if there are any specific feedback. Any specific feedback for Jenny regarding the idea of how to reference. Um, active uses or corner lots. Um, and we can certainly follow up following this meeting as well, but I'll take any um, comments that people would like to give at this time, starting with Ken. 
Yeah, I would uh, like to strike uh, banks and offices and find some other uh, verbiage uh, to do that. Uh, and as far as corner lots, I think we have been addressing it. You know, generally sometimes selecting it, selecting the primary uh, street as that. Um, Gene brings up a good point where the two, the two the secondary street's pretty primary too. And that's, I think it's a one-off. I think some of the ones we have locked, talked about, there has been a primary and a secondary and we have um, looked at it in that way. So I'm not too, not as concerned about that. That's my two cents worth. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what to do about corner lots because I think ideally if the, the streets on both sides were, you know, fairly major, then you would want the um, standards to apply on both of those sides. Um, on the other hand, if you have a storefront occupying one of the streets that goes back to the end, you're not necessarily gonna have an entrance on the other side. So I think we might have to add something in here that says, you know, when there are corner lots, the board shall consider these standards in determining, you know, what's appropriate for each one of the public facing streets or something like that, which I think is what Ken was saying, um, that we would need to do something like that. Um, but I think the part that I think we don't want to give up is there shouldn't be any blank facades on any of the public streets. So we have to be careful, I think, about how we do that wording. Um, so that's my thought about maybe the best way to handle corner lots, but maybe other people have much better ideas than I do about that. On the other question, which was active uses, um, I don't know, maybe rather than saying other non-active uses, you can flip it around to be that generates, you know, that generates activity or, you know what I mean? Flip it so it's not uh, non-active uses, but you flip it to a positive. That's my only suggestion about that part. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa. Um, thank you. I don't have any comments at this time. Great, thank you. Steve? Oh, sorry, before, well, Steve, why don't yeah. you run through and then I'll, I'll get back to Kelly. Let her hand up. Okay. I was going to say, uh, I, nothing, uh, I have nothing to add, thank you. Okay, Kelly. I was actually just gonna say something uh, akin to the suggestion that uh, what Jean made, which is to change the last clause in the purpose statement to instead of and limit the amount of ground force place occupied by non-active uses to instead say to something more like encourage and to encourage the amount of active ground floor uses. And I think active ground floor uses being more commonly defined as sort of more commercial activity. Um, and and it, we, can, we can find um, actual definitions for that just to be a little bit more precise. I think that's great. I would definitely support that. And I see a lot of heads nodding in the <laughs> affirmative direction there. All right, um, any additional comments on uh, from the board on Article 28 before we move to the next article? Okay, let me get back to my agenda. So we will now, um, move to Article 29, which is the zoning bylaw amendment related to uh, street trees. And I will turn this over to uh, Jenny. All right, I'm gonna run through this one. So Article 29 is about street trees. And the goal here is to, dis to protect and preserve trees um, and to plant new ones, ideally. Um, it is to the whole bylaw amendment is describing the town's procedures and requirements for the preservation of trees. This is particularly around public shade trees. The ARB has the ability to waive requirements um, when necessary. 
It applies only to trees located on uh, private property. The tree warden maintains the tree inventory and there's plantings of 200 to, 300, 200 to 300 new trees annually. This is also following the requirements that we set forth in those site uh, standards section around the industrial uses that were adopted last year. Um, public shade trees are part of, uh, they're part of laws that are governed by the Commonwealth. And so the definition is essentially picking up that same, uh, those same rules around what a public shade tree actually is. The proposed amendment follows standards that are set forth in other communities as well. So there's some precedent for it. Um, and this is with regards to the tree placement, the size, the type, and the maintenance. Um, the purpose of this amendment is to uh, is fivefold, providing for adequate public shade tree coverage along Arlington's main corridors, which this board has purview over, um, to implement carbon neutral policies of the town, to address heat island effects emanating from the main corridors, to enhance public health and walkability with proper shading, and to create zoning, uh, specifically this definition around public shade trees for clarity. So it is applicable in the business districts, again, around new construction or additions over 50% of the footprint or redevelopment, anything that is subject to the review of the redevelopment board. And the provision is to provide one public shade tree every 25 linear feet of lot frontage along the public right of way. It would be administered under 3.4 and it would include the following standards planted within existing and proposed planting strips and in sidewalk tree wells on streets without planting strips. Um, trees would be selected from an approved tree list that would be set, set forth by the tree committee and approved by the tree warden. The tree warden is also, just to be clear, is a, an employee of the town working full-time in the Department of uh, Public Works. When planted, trees must be a minimum height of 10 feet or two inches in caliper. All new trees shall be maintained in with under certain standards. I won't read all of the standards. Um, and when there is not a suitable location within the right of way, shade trees may be proposed in locations within the lot or in exceptional circumstances. The board may allow the owner to make a financial contribution to the Arlington Tree Fund. Um, we also might be able to grant through the redevelopment board's review um, an increase in the spacing requirements between plantings when appropriate. Um, and then we further create a computation of how many trees need to be planted depending upon uh, the total number and the total amount of feet available to for that planting. And I think I'm gonna stop there and see if there are comments or questions. Great, thank you, Jenny. I'll start with Ken. No, I have none. Uh, this is good, support this 100%. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean? Agree with Ken. All right, Melissa? Same. Steve? Uh, I've got two comments, uh, but I also support it 100%. <laughs> um, first, in terms of the definition, uh, or the proposed change to the definition, we use the text uh, public right-of-way. Um, which I believe was actually my, might have been my suggestion. Um, I noted, I went back and looked at Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 81, Section 1, to see how the state defines public shade tree. Uh, they use the phrase public way rather than public right, right of way. Um, I mean, to me, the two terms are basically equivalent. I don't know if there's value in taking, in keeping the, making the wording identical, but you know, it's something we may want to consider and, and um, you know, sorry to keep going back and forth uh, on that one sentence. Um, the other the other question or the other thing I wanted to mention was in Section 634D, uh, it mentions American Standards for Nursery Stock. When we were working on the industrial district version of this, uh, one of the questions that came up was, well, if there is a standard and the something happens to the standard or standards organization, then what you know what happens to the bylaw after that? Um, I the part from the industrial district that seems to match is five six two d five, which actually just doesn't mention any particular 
you know, nursery standard or something, et cetera. Um, you know, it may be worth just trying to take what we've done in the industrial district and, um, you know, just essentially mirror it, uh, you know, mirror it for uh, this uh, section 6-3. Um, but yeah, I, I'm supportive of this. Great, thank you, Steve. I appreciate those two suggestions. And I am supportive as well. Um, so any additional questions? If not, I will go ahead and open this up to uh, public comment. All right, uh, any member of the public wishing to comment on uh, the proposal for Article 29, um, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. We'll start with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I, I apologize. I had not expected to speak so much tonight. I'm sorry you're hearing so much from me, but I've... It's quite all right. Everything now. Um, what... Um, I, uh, I'm also a member of the tree committee, um, as Susan Stamps mentioned earlier. And um, I, although I'm not speaking for the committee tonight because we've not really uh, discussed this, um, I want to uh, agree with all the members of the board how uh, wholeheartedly I approve of this. Uh, I think this is an excellent move um, to have uh, business uh, owners and developers take some responsibility for uh, increasing the tree canopy. Um, up till now, the tree committee has been focusing very hard on uh, um, public shade trees on tree strips and also uh, with a couple of programs and adopt a tree and the uh, tree canopy program that where we try and encourage uh, private owners to uh, have more trees. Um, but let me ask you a question. On the first slide, I believe there was a point about this applies to private trees. Is that what I saw as you quickly went through it? And I, I don't quite, I, I, admit, I think maybe I missaw it because it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and uh, the second question would be that any trees that get planted in either the tree strip or on private property that is business owned um, needs to have a watering plan. We have found on the tree committee, this is a very big issue in that trees get planted all the time. Two inch caliper, 10 foot tall trees is great. They're, they're a little pricier and they're absolutely worth the investment. However, if you don't water them, they die. And so many of the trees that we plant around town have this problem where they don't get adequate water. The uh, DPW and tree warden tries to keep after it with the new trees at the town plants with a pretty good degree of success. But so often it's the maintenance that doesn't get followed up on programs like this. So I'm glad to see the reference in the, in the amendment or in the, uh, proposal of the article for uh, the maintenance standards, because those are more almost more critical than the type and size of tree that you plant. Um, so anyway, thank you, Madam Chair, for listening to my third rant tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jenny, I'll turn it over to you to address the question about private trees. Um, and for the second item, if we, I, I actually agree with Steve's um, concern about including a specific standard because standards do change. We got into this with the building code and a couple of things um, last year, um, but perhaps if there is a way for us to work with something regarding a watering plan um, and perhaps the town body that um, provides resources as opposed to a specific standard because that group would then um, provide them with a standard. But if you could address the private trees question, that would yeah. be great. I think that was just confusing in my presentation because I went a little fast. It was, I think I was, I was just referencing that we currently have, you know, Article 16, which is the Tree Protection and Preservation uh, Bylaw. So I, that was that, which is about private tree on uh, trees on private property. So, sorry, that was a little fast in the beginning, but I was oh. not talking about this. This is about public trees. And in terms of watering, right. actually, I. Uh, just briefly, Kelly, we looked into sort of more detailed language and we talked to uh, the tree warden about this. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah, I think again, I mean, that was where the um, American Standard for Nursery Stock Standards came in because that's a standard uh, currently used that the tree warden referred to and as well as the Conservation Commission. Um, and that would include standards for watering. So um, that's that's that section 6.3.4 D is meant to be sort of comprehensive about like how the tree is maintained. Um, but if, you know, I guess it's a matter of whether the board would want to um, I think maybe refer instead to standards um, administered by the tree warden and then um, and, and include for maintenance and watering or something like that. Just be very specific about watering. Great, thank you. Uh, Jean, I see you have your hand up on this particular topic and then we'll move to the next public comment. I think, I think a better way maybe to do this is not to get rid of those standards, but to say, or other standards the redevelopment board may designate, something like that. Um, because as long as those standards are in place, as Kelly said, they have the things we want in them, but if they're gone or we don't like them, then we'll have the ability to designate something else. So I'd like to say that or something else that we designate. Great, thanks. Um, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I'd like to thank the planning department and the board for sponsoring this article. I think there's a unanimous agreement about with everyone here that it's a good thing. I'm, I'm just wondering about the wording under the standards section whether there needs to be some language more specific as who is responsible for these things, particularly like all new trees shall be maintained. Um, perhaps that's adequate. I'm just wondering if we should have it um, clear that it's the property owner that has to maintain it. And I don't see anything here in terms of penalties if, the property owner does not maintain the tree. They're just my thoughts. Great, thank you very much. Um, I don't know that we necessarily, we have a requirement here for the length of time that they need to be. Indeed, I apologize, there is a hurricane, it sounds like outside my window, so. <laughs> um, uh, we, I think in general, this would fall under um, the requirements of, um, of the environmental design review, and uh, that would cover penalties. Would you say that that's correct, Jenny? Or do you think that there's something else that needs to be included? We, I was more, I was thinking that we don't have se like separate sections that right. necessarily have penalties right. uh, embedded in them. You know, like a penalty of the bylaw would be enforced by inspectional services. Right. Um, so I, I'm not sure that we would add that specifically here. The other point made, um, or the question, I guess it was more of a, a suggestion about adding who maintained the trees. I think we could talk about that a little bit, or that could also be something that gets um, stated in any, as we do with any decision, we are speaking directly to the, pro the property owner usually when we write our decisions. So that's how it gets, that's how it happens. But I suppose the language could be different here um, as well. So to answer Great. those points. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Ken? I thought it states right here, say all new trees shall be maintained in accordance with the American standard for nursery stocks for a period no less than 36 months from the date of planting. So the, it's the owner to, that's who's doing this is responsible for the trees for, um, for the next three years. Mm -hmm. That's usually enough time for the tree date established. And they usually, uh, American standards for nursery stocks usually is um, the gator bags they put on the, on the trees and uh, they just have to maintain that being filled with water. It's not a, it's not a hard task. It's just when the bags uh, are not 
full, you fill it. <laughs> and they just have to do it for the next three years. Um, and then hopefully they can survive on their own or the town can pick up the maintenance from there, you know? Yeah. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, and, and Steve, um, if you have one, one last point on, on this, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that and then we'll close public comment. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, three years is the same standard that the town uses to water the trees and the planted trees, that is. And um, uh, I, uh, one other point that I forgot to make earlier was, I think I heard uh, Ms. Wright speak to that the business owners would have an option of contributing to the town tree fund. That would be the Trees Please Fund. Um, I would suggest that that only be exercised at the approval of the board or the planning department because otherwise you're just encouraging basically a relatively easy way out and then no maintenance. We want to encourage the owners to plant and maintain trees, not just check off one more box on their redevelopment project. So uh, that, that's, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, and I believe that that control is in section 6.3.5 in what has been proposed. So um, that, that looks like that caveat is in there. Um, so with that, I will um, uh, will will move back to the board for any final questions. Um, I'll just run through really quickly before we move on to the next article. So uh, any final questions, Jean? Ken? No, you are correct. There's a huge thunderstorm outside. There's. I'm sorry. You storm outside? Yeah. There's a huge yeah. storm outside right now. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Yeah. It came up all of a sudden while I was speaking, so it just startled me. Uh, Melissa, any any final questions? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, great. Steve? Uh, no additional questions. All right. Thank you. Jenny, do you have what you need from, from the board? I have everything I need. Thank you for the great. comments and from the public and the board. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we'll move on to our last article of this evening, Article 30, which is the zoning bylaw amendment related to solar energy systems. I will um, hand it over to Jenny, and then I believe that we have uh, two speakers this evening who will be uh, presenting this article. So, Jenny. I am going to actually just say welcome to Talia Fox, who is our sustainability manager. She is actually going to make this presentation. And then Shelly Dean, I believe, is still here. She's a representative, but she serves on the Clean Energy Future Committee. Um, it's not necessarily completely speaking on behalf of the committee, but will speak to this article as well. So the two of them are going to share the time. I'm just going to let Talia take it away from here because of the time. Um, and Kelly is advancing the slides. So if people have questions, uh, you can refer them to Talia or Shelley. Great, thank, thank you. you. Welcome, Talia. Thank you very much. So good evening. I am Talia Fox. I am the new sustainability manager for the town and there is indeed a storm outside. It is a pleasure to meet uh, those of you I haven't met. I'll be speaking briefly to Article 30. Um, the purpose of the proposed amendment is to require installation of solar energy systems for buildings subject to environmental design review, with some exceptions, as well as introduce definitions related to solar energy systems. So currently, the town's zoning bylaw enables ground-mounted solar systems by right only in the industrial district. And this was approved by town meeting in 2010, among uh, other criteria that enable us to be a green community and to be eligible for funding from the state's Department of Energy Resources. Solar energy systems are not prohibited by our zoning bylaw and other districts, they just require a, a building permit. And in historic districts, there are certain design guidelines uh, that apply. Some events of relevance are here on the right. Uh, a zoning audit completed in 2015 as part of our master plan process, as well as a subsequent update to that audit in 2017 as part of recodification, noted that provisions related to solar energy systems were generally missing throughout the bylaw. And in 2021, town meeting passed an amendment to the bylaw requiring new commercial and mixed use buildings in the industrial district to be solar ready. I think it's worth noting that last year also Arlington's net zero action plan was completed and adopted by town meeting. 
And that net zero action plan actually includes as a priority measure this amendment to adopt a solar requirement. Solar is a piece of our strategy to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and to achieve several of the goals stated in that plan effectively all rooftops in Arlington that have the capacity for and are suitable uh, for solar will need a solar energy system. And so um, thinking about the number of actual rooftops that are suitable uh, to suited to solar, that's about 75% of the total number of roofs or 9,000 roofs. Um, Arlington is not alone in proposing this kind of solar requirement. The cities of Watertown and Medford both have bylaws requiring solar energy systems for new large construction and several other communities listed here, including Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, Lexington, and Wellesley have mechanisms that require consideration of solar from among a suite of green building requirements, even if they don't outright or specifically require solar. And the proposed amendment itself adds several definitions uh, that you see here relating to solar energy systems to clarify terms that are used in the text of this amendment, as well as terms that are already used in other sections of the zoning bylaw. A new section 6.4 would require solar energy systems on 50% of the roof area for buildings subject to environmental design review. The ARB could reduce this requirement where 50% of the roof area is not viable for solar. Where there is a parking structure, a solar energy system would need to cover 90% of its top level. And the amendment also specifies that the ARB can adopt rules and regulations to require specific additional information as part of the application. Um, there are several exemptions noted in the amendment, uh, such as for circumstances where there's insufficient load capacity or a roof has too much shade, as well as exceptions for facade alterations, temporary signage, outdoor uses, religious uses, among other um, other exemptions listed here. And ARB can reduce or waive requirements if an applicant proposes a suitable alternative to meet the goals of the section. And then last, there are some provisions regarding emergency access and egress and safety, as well as um, exclusion of solar energy systems in determining the height and floor area of the building. And with that, I will conclude. And I think, should I hand it to Shelley or back over to, I think I'll hand it to, oh, to Shelley. Yep, that great. would be great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Shelley Dean. I live at 7 Cleveland Street in East Arlington and have been an Arlington resident for um, almost 40 years. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also here as a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee, um, though I'm not speaking for the Clean Energy Future Committee. We didn't actually vote on this um, in our last meeting. Um, so I, I just want to reiterate um, many of the things that Talia has already mentioned that, you know, this, um, uh, this proposed ordinance is um, uh, very much very similar to the ordinances that were approved in both Watertown and in Medford um, in Watertown in 2018 and in, in Medford in 2019. Um, but I've spoken to the um, uh, planning director and assist, uh, assistant town manager in Watertown, um, Steve Magoon, who just uh, raved about it and said, um, you know, it, it has, um, in their instance, um, it's produced solar on about 10 to 15 buildings. He didn't have the exact number when I spoke to him. Um, they were thinking about expanding it, um, th that um, any objective that there had been nobody who had sought any exemptions on it, um, even though there were exemptions allowed, and that um, he felt like it was a very positive experience for the town. Um, I spoke with somebody also um, in Medford in their planning and environment department um, who also spoke positively about it. It's a newer, um, it's a new, newer ordinance for them and uh, so they didn't have quite as many cases to speak to, but in general uh, had very many positive things. And I just want to reiterate the fact that um, this is very much in keeping with not only the town's net um, zero action plan, but the state's um, climate legislation, 
which really commits the state to net zero by 2050. Um, and that has interim goals for um, uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of at least 50% by 2030. Um, and that the amendment is a very tangible way to work towards those goals. It, um, uh, you know, it, it won't um, increase the amount of impervious surface. We're really talking about putting solar on already impervious roofs and perhaps um, uh, top levels of garages should they, should they be um, constructed. Um, and and um, I'm hoping that folk, uh, folks from ARB will vote positively for this. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate all the work that you and Talia have put into this and um, look forward to the discussion. So uh, any questions from members of the board? We'll start with Ken. Yes, I'm generally supportive of this. I just have one comment that I'd like to add to see if you guys are willing to make it. I'm not sure where to stick this, uh, but the location or placement of solar panels are prohibited when it uh, precludes your adjacent uh, neighbor from uh, building uh, their building to the uh, full extent of what's allowed by zoning. Okay, I know that's kind of wordy and everything else, but I'm just worried that if someone sticks a solar panel adjacent, right, right to the next to their side yard, and then all of a sudden they say, okay, someone's gonna build their building, which is allowed by zoning, but now it blocks this, the solar panel. They can fight back and say, uh, you're, you're blocking my solar panels uh, rays. I think that's unfair to the neighbors. So I think if we add a, a note there saying that locations of these solar panels cannot preclude your neighbors from building out what's rightfully theirs or if they if they do do that there's no recourse saying that you have to um, you have to uh they can't do that you just have to move your panel something along those lines i uh i'm going to trust gene to word it much better than me he's much more of a better wordsmith than i am or if he, or, or he may not agree with me i'm not sure that's all i had to say great thank you uh, but I, I support this right away 100 percent Thank you. I think that's a good point that you just brought up. Jean? Yeah, I support it 100% too, partially because I work with Shelly and Talia on putting it together. Um, I'm not sure what you're getting at, um, Ken, on that, because even if the next door property, maybe at some time, could be built up higher, there's no guarantee it ever would. And if we put something in that said, you know, um, if another building could go up higher, you don't have to put in solar, we'd basically be cutting the legs out from under this. Currently, under law, somebody can build another building and block somebody else's solar panels. Nothing prevents it right now. So I don't, unless I'm missing something, I don't really see where what you're asking for is necessary for this, unless you want to make sure that people can't put solar on the roof if somebody can build a taller building next door. Uh, do you want to take yourself off mute, Ken? That's what exactly I'm saying. Let's say I have a, I have a, a, a piece of property and my next door neighbor has a one-story garage. And uh, I guess I can throw one solar panel up along the side of my uh, along the side of my um, building there, and it'll prevent him from doing what's allowed by zoning, and and, and have him build uh, three or four stories, which it, is allowed by zoning. But now he comes back and says, "You're blocking my sunlight." It it does it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. The state zoning code gives us the option if we wanted to, to put something in about not blocking someone else's solar, but we have never put that into our zoning bylaw. So therefore, if I put solar on my roof and somebody wants to come later on and build something 
taller. There's nothing to prevent them from doing that. That's all I want to put them in there. That's just, I just so want to no note. So there's no need to put it in here because that's the way it works right now. Um, well, you're the lawyer. I'm not going to uh, argue with you about that, Gene. I, I just, well, let's, but let's you, see, ask, you see what I'm trying to get at, okay? I know, but and, let's ask Talia, who's our like energy, whatever this fancy title expert is about this. So the point that you raised, Jean, I think makes sense to me in that Arlington has not enacted anything in zoning to prevent folks from doing this already. Is that what I'm understanding? You're, you're saying I'm, I'm repeating that correctly. Yes. So I think it, I think it's worth asking the question, if, if you're going to put that in here, is that something you want to ask more broadly for, for uh, the zoning bylaw? Is that... A fair response there. Well, if we're gonna ask, if we're gonna make this to the zoning bylaw, I just want to make sure that we we're not being unfair and treating neighbors of take uh, uh, unconsciously saying um, you know you're taking away their rights of building what they need to what, what they're allowed to build. I'm not saying you know they can build more, but it's it, it, it could be un, you know. It could happen that way. And has this been has this come up in a state or anywhere else where this became an issue? And how did he resolve it? I'm I'm not sure, but I, mean, I just see it as as a, as a consequence that could happen. And if Gene, you're right, then you're right. I, I then so I'll tell you this anecdote, and I don't know if it's true everywhere, but um, so there's this case in Wisconsin a number of years ago where somebody had solar at their house and their neighbor wanted to build a house next door that would have shaded it. And, and they basically sued. And the court said basically that there used to be this common law doctrine called the doctrine of ancient lights, which said you could never block a neighbor's lights, but that was thrown out by the courts in like the 17 or 1800s because it would have completely prevented industrialization, buildings, stuff like that. So there's no doctrine like that in Massachusetts. There's nothing other than something we would put in the bylaw that says you can't block a neighbor's solar panels. If you wanted, well, I guess we could put something here that says, you know, nothing in this section shall prevent an, a butter from blocking this solar panel. If that would make you happy, we could put it in. It would. Um, okay, we wanna make Ken happy. So I guess we'll find a place if other people agree to put that just one sentence in. Why don't we, um... Why don't we move to Melissa and, and Steve and get their take on this as well, and then we can circle back after public comment um, regarding any additional uh, modification, if that works. Jean, uh, did you have other did you have other items, Jean? Okay, uh, Melissa. I don't have a comment at this time. I mean, I think it makes sense if the wording helps to clarify and reinforce um, Ken, you know, and secure what Ken's trying to get to. I'm fine with that. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Steve? Yeah, I uh, know there, I, I do, I understand where Mr. Lau is coming from. Um, and I, I do like that idea. I think it's not only an issue or potentially not only an issue with buildings being redeveloped developed or redeveloped at different times, but also shade, you know, honestly, tr shade trees. So, um, you know, I wouldn't want a solar panel to prevent, you know, the planting of a public shade tree because the shade tree might grow up and might grow and eventually, you know, shade the solar panel. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're, the you know, wording to be worked out, but I, I think it's a good idea. Great, thank you, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I think I similarly went to the same place as, as Ken trying to think about the fact that the town is going to require people to make these investments in solar panels. And at the same time, we're looking at things like FAR and, you know, 
changing people's ability to, to build higher? Um, and what impact does that have on the investment that people are making that we're going to be requiring that people make in solar on their roofs? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it's where my head started to go as, as well. So, um, Jean? Yeah, I, I just think if, if you think of all of the buildings that we've issued special permits to in the past few years, I, I can't think of one that ended up later on where the roof has gotten shaded from something else. You know, we're not generally talking about short buildings. You're, and you're absolutely right. I think it's, you know, part of it may be just thinking about going back and looking at those those instances and where the application might be and you know again thinking about um where it isn't in terms of the the um applications that that we've approved so far so um, again i think that's part of where i'm still trying to wrap my head around with this one and i think it's possible we'll put in a sentence that basically gets it gets at that great yeah. all right thank you i mean i, I just see a homeowner putting one solar panel on the edge of their roof and it's the rear setback and it's blocked and the sun's blocking their solar panel. I don't, Gene, you know what I'm saying, right? I mean. Right, but this is never going to be a homeowner. This is just a, a commercial. For, uh, I, I see, I see the, your point, uh, but but okay. But I'll, I'll come back next year with a, with a warrant article to deal with that, with the homeowner one, okay? <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. All right. So with that, I'd like to move to the public comment period. Um, and uh, Steve Moore, you're up first. Yes, once again. Um, I think Mr. Lau's comments are, are very well taken. I'm glad he's thinking ahead because this will happen. There will be some time when someone else builds and shades someone's mandated solar panel. Um, so I think it's smart to be thinking ahead, particularly when we start changing all the, the zoning to do with density along Mass Ave where the uh, business districts intersect with the residential districts. Um, and also I want to applaud Mr. Revlax uh, speaking to the tree issue because that's, that's why I raised my hand here. Uh, uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street, member of the tree committee. Uh, I, um, I want to be sure that the additional requirement of businesses and such to put solar panels on the roofs of businesses and homes or whatever we're talking about here does not require or force the cutting down of shade trees. Yes. Very large trees will shade solar panels clearly and small trees that get planted will grow up to uh, be a problem as Mr. Revelak points out. Um, climate change and the issues related to that and energy uh, net zero and uh, trying to be energy neutral and all that stuff. It's a complicated issue. Trees are beneficial to that. Solar panels are beneficial to that. Trees and solar panels don't get along very well. So we have to make sure that trees aren't being taken to uh, encourage solar panel development because you're creating a problem by taking the trees. You don't wanna create a problem by solving a problem, so to speak. So I think that sensitivity is important to, to keep in mind here. Um, I don't know if I'm suggesting words be added to this, uh, to this, this change related to shade trees, because I don't even know how that would be worded, but I think you do want to consider not encouraging business owners to take down shade trees that are on their property, of which there may be some, I, I don't know. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, Steve. And I'll just respond that um, I believe that that's addressed in the way that this is written through the first um, exemption where it talks about um, exemptions for Solar, solar ready zones that are shaded. And that would include shaded by being shaded by existing trees. So I, I think that that is um, definitely covered already in, oh, in, this, um, in this section. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. I, I, know what you're, I know what you're saying, but I wanna make sure, I, it's a chicken and egg problem in terms of, does the shade get taken before the application gets made for the trees? Uh, solar panels, I'm sorry. Um, do you see what I'm saying? I I, 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 I do. And, and again, we'll, we'll kind of debate this as a, as a group, okay. um, but I, you. I, your point is well taken for sure. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see, any other members of the public wishing to speak on this article? Okay, uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to the board and I'll run through again to see if there are any additional um, questions or, or comments on Article 30, starting with Jean. Um, no, I, I, you know, we'll add the sentence, I think, if other people want to do that. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any incentive built in this for somebody to take down a tree. Um, in fact, it's the opposite in any, you know, in that if, if it's shaded, they don't have to put on um, the solar, whatever they're putting up there, you know, the solar, system, solar energy system. So there, there's no incentive for anybody to take down a tree here. They're not required to, or even Great. incentivized to. Great, thanks, Gene. Ken? No, I think with the change, um... I'm all set with this. I, uh, I trust Gene and Woodsmith in this correctly. Great, thank you. Steve? Ah, yes, um, a note I had written to myself in section 641. Um, in the last sentence, there should be a space between the words section 6.4 and the word of. Okay. And that's all I got. Great, thank you. Melissa? No, not at this time. Okay. So with that, uh, that takes us through the um, Warren article public hearings that are on our agenda for this evening. Um, so before we move to our next agenda item, I need to see if there's a motion to continue the open public hearing um, for the 2022 annual town meeting Warren articles to our next scheduled date, which is uh, March 14th. I so move. Second. Take a roll call vote. Sorry, Jenny, did you have something? I saw you just unmuted. Um, okay. I'll, I'll come back at the, when you're done. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so we'll take a roll call vote, starting with uh, Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. And I'll go to Jenny before we move to agenda item number two. This is quick and unfortunately Shelly dropped off, but I was just going to thank Talia and Shelly, um, Jean and Kelly, and also Coralie Cooper, who is the chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee for all of their work, pulling this together in a very short period of time. A lot of meetings, a lot of back and forth and research and it was very appreciated and helped us to have a good discussion tonight. So thank you. Great, yes. I think we all echo our, our thanks and to the uh, planning department and all of the staff for the very thorough memo that was created for all of the Warren articles this evening. So thank you very much for that as well. You're welcome. Please expect another one for next week. <laughs> So yes, the marathon is on. Happy reading. Okay. Uh, let's see. So our next um, our next agenda item, agenda item number two, is the draft meeting schedule from May through December. Um, so I hope everyone had a chance to review this. Jenny, um, if you wanted to maybe take us through um, at least maybe through the the, the May um, dates. I think there's a, an April 7th kind of hiding in there that was um, probably a, a holdover from a previous draft or something, but um, if there's anything you wanted to highlight in yeah, put I see that. together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't go back to April after May 23rd. <laughs> no, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> On any calendar, nope. Um, so, okay, well, one thing we were gonna say is that April 4th and April 7th, with those meetings will be on Zoom um, and then uh, we had talked about after, well, so town meeting, it is not yet known if it will be in person or on or remote. Um, so that is TBD. And when I learn of what will be, I will share that with the board. Um, but the current schedule only went through April, which uh, town meeting starts on April 25th. So there would be an expectation for the board members to be in attendance. It's just that I don't know where that will be at this point in time. Um, Rachel and I had talked about having resuming in-person redevelopment board meetings after town meeting, 
which may potentially be my guess still is May 23rd, um, not May 16th, but it could be May 16th um, that we would resume our in-person meetings. If that's a town meeting night, then that'll be a different um, a different meeting. Um, and so that uh, the rest of the schedule basically just takes us through the end of the year. And we would be meeting at 7.30 per, uh, p.m. Uh, I think we agreed that, that we wanted to keep that time, but I'm also open to going back to, I think it's now a couple of years ago that we were meeting at 7 p.m. when we were meeting in person, there was a little bit of talk about that where if we came back to being in person, maybe we would want to change the time, but I've left it at 7.30 for now. And I think that that was it. Was there anything else that we talked about, Rachel? Um, no, I think that that was it. The only other thing I'll just note is that at some point, the um, we had talked about the uh, hybrid pilot program, um, which will take effect um, in terms of um, something that we'll need to fold into our, our meetings that has yet to be finalized in terms of when that will start and process and where we will meet as well. So that's something that um, I think more information will be forthcoming on. Right, and th this would basically be similar to what I think the select board is doing this evening, which they started to do and maybe did maybe twice last summer where the board and staff were in the meeting room, but other people could participate remotely via Zoom or another platform. And so, yes, we'll we'll investigate that when uh, that option becomes available. Right. If. Yeah, yes. Great, um, so I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of move around the, um, call on the, the board members for any thoughts on um, timing for meeting back in person. Um, again, what we proposed May 23rd, um, but also on any of these dates that you know currently you have a conflict with. So I'll start with Ken. Uh, no, I have no problems with the dates right now, as is. I would vote for a 7.30 start uh, if it's still in person. It makes it easier for me to get from work to there. Seven o'clock pushing it very tight uh, for me. Okay, great. And do you have any um, thoughts on uh, in-person meeting starting at the end of May? I think that's great. Okay. I, I would like to, to have, go back to in-person. I think we get a better review on the projects when we do that in, in, uh, in, uh, in person. Great, thanks Ken. Jean? Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I don't really have a preference between 7 and 7.30 start. When do you think we might have more information about when we can run these as hybrid meetings? So um, from my work on that committee, um, I think that we're probably not going to be fully equipped to run these as hybrid meetings until um, July. Um, there, you know, it could be sooner than that, but part of it depends on the availability of technology. Right now that's being specified and priced and the meeting rooms still need to be identified. So that's part of one of the goals, I think, of, of taking the, the walk through the central or the um, community center, formerly the central school, is to understand what has already been built into that space that we might be able to take advantage of. Um, you know, that will all affect timing as well. So it could be June. It, it could be July. I think that's still um, still currently up in the air. And I think at one point, some time ago, Jenny said something like, we might no longer have to meet into the little room in the town hall annex and could meet in a larger meeting room in the community center. Do you think that would be available as of May 23rd? Yeah, I can I can start booking that room for us for all of these meetings, basically, if you want. Um, maybe you know we're we're going to be there next Tuesday, right? Um, uh, I believe so. I think it's the is that the fifteenth? Yes. Yes. So next I Tuesday. think you know take take a look, and um, it's no problem to book that space. And also that space, so it's the main room that you you know the old main room now can actually divide up into two separate rooms. But I mean, the volume of people that were in attendance at this meeting earlier this evening 
that would fit into the big, the whole room uh, easily. So, I mean, I think that we could probably just book that room from this point forward. Yeah. I and it has a projector, it has all the equipment in it. Yeah. You know, in some ways the little room was, you know, sort of nice and, you know, close, but there were hardly any meetings when there weren't people standing out in the hall. And, right. You know, so, you know, even when we don't have 60 or 70 people coming, if there was more than one permit on the agenda, something like that, you know, the room couldn't accommodate. So I think a larger room um, would be better. Um, as to the dates, I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna be around on June 6th, but other than that, I'm good for all the dates. Okay, um, what we'll do is we'll just collect dates that don't work. And then once everyone has gone through, we'll um, look at some of the adjacent dates and see if we can't find, um, find a date around there. So I'll start June 6th. Uh, Melissa. Um, <clears throat> In terms of dates, so the July, we're not having July meetings. Yeah, I, I, I cut out July. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. Was that, I mean, I'm just wondering, because I know was I, actually, no, I, I really, I, I, I honestly, you could take off August or July. The board has not had a break in schedule for years now. And okay. I think we've had, we've done quite a lot consistently for the past two years, very challenging times. And I think you deserve a little break. So either it could be July or August. I just did that for you, but you can <laughs> choose or you can choose to meet, but I think you might think about it. Okay. Um, I just know, I think August 15th, I am, I cannot do. Great, thank you. And um, Melissa, did you have a preference 7.30 start time? Oh, okay. yeah, I prefer 730, but. Okay, great. Uh, Steve, any dates that are a challenge for you? Thoughts on timing of return or start time? Uh, so I don't believe any of the dates are challenging for me. Um, I'm fine with a 730 start time. Uh, it does help to have a little, little slack to get away from work. Um, and resuming in-person meetings after town meeting is fine with is fine with me i i do have one question um since we typically meet on monday nights and i am a town meeting member um i guess this might be a question for jenny but in terms of time conflicts between arb meetings and town meeting how has that typically been resolved in the past we, in the past, we've met, you know, it depends. If we have hearings, we will have some public hearings actually that we're gonna have to figure out how to blend mm -hmm. in the middle of actually our warrant article hearings. <laughs> so well, there's gonna be some carryover and we're going to need to meet before town meeting. So what we've done is uh, usually seven to 7.45 um, in the past, and then you adjourn and town meeting starts at eight. I, at the question is going to be, this issue of if it's in person or remote. And, you know, if you, we can't, the, also the, the potential for the in-person meeting is not necessarily in the town hall aud, aud, um, auditorium. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, we'll have to kind of play this by ear a little bit mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, if we have to meet before town meeting, where's that going to be? How are we going to do that? So we might need to revisit, um, I, I, I guess just revisit it when it's time. I don't have the answer right now, but it was typically seven to seven forty-five before the meeting. All right, thank you. All right, um, and then just for my schedule, I am also not available on August fifteenth. Um, so I think that's two of us for that date, and then Jean isn't available on the sixth. So um, I guess. To that end, um, does it make more sense to meet in July and take August off in that in that case? Um, and do does anyone have a concern with meeting in July and and not August um, and flipping those? No, from Ken. 
No from Steve. No from Melissa. Um, Gene, are you good with meeting in um, July and taking August off? I'm checking my calendar. Yeah, the, okay. the main thing would just be that we wouldn't obviously meet the first and third Mondays because the first is a holiday. It'll be the so 11th and the 25th, right? Um, potentially, yes. I think I I think I'm good in July. Does anyone um, have a concern with the 11th and the 25th instead of the two August dates? Okay. And we'll keep June 6th. Is that okay, or do you want to move that? Um, I would be fine moving that. Well, then we'd have two in a row. You can have a meeting without me. Can we just leave it flexible for now to see what comes up? Then we decide. Yeah, we could do that and we could always move it. There's, I mean, I would hate for our hearing to start and for us only to have four people. So um, yeah, we could we could do that. So Jenny, we would just need to know the meeting beforehand correct so that we could officially change the date? Yes. Okay. All right, so by May 23rd, we'll make a call on June 6th. Okay. Um, well, I think that is it for the draft ARB schedule. Do you need us to vote? I think we typically vote on that, correct? Usually yeah. do. We'll do a vote. Yeah. So is there a motion to approve the um, meeting schedule May through December, 2022 as amended? So motion. Back in. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote starting with Ken. Yes. Dean. Yes. Steve. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that closes agenda item number two. Um, the next item is open forum. So if there are any um, members of the public uh, still with us this evening who wish to speak, please use the raise hand function. Okay, seeing none, we will close open forum. And uh, any other items from the board before we adjourn? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. For a second. Second. I'll second. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, take a roll. <laughs> Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Steve? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us through this late night. Have a good evening. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Next Bye, Monday. Everyone. Yeah.